Thanks, Jim. We're really excited to get rolling on day three here. We've had an uh, incredible first two days. Um, yesterday, some of the highlights, certainly hearing from the de uh, Department of Energy and their ecosystem, I know is very valuable as well. Uh, thank you to everyone for the contributions during the three breakout sessions and then the outbriefs. I think that uh, provided a lot of valuable insights that we can you know, not only take forward from an AFRL perspective, but also when you go back to your home institutions as well. And then finally, we had great turnouts and uh, certainly a lot of interaction at the poster sessions yesterday. So not done yet, not done yet. Big day here today. Uh, so certainly um, some of the highlights this morning, we'll be hearing from vast array of um, our Air Force Office of Scientific Research, uh, including some of the programs being funded, our international office and uh, our chief scientists in uh, Washington, in uh, Arlington. And then we'll be, uh, I know, fun for a lot of folks. We'll be going on lab tours, seeing uh, our networking labs and what we're doing here at AFRL. Uh, and then finally, we'll be wrapping up today with a keynote address from Professor Thomas Genovine, uh, who will be talking about quantum networking and some of the satellite communications work that he has uh, really been pioneering. So first up, let me uh, welcome our chief scientists of the AFRL Information Directorate, Dr. Mark Linderman. Dr. Linderman serves as the Directorate's Principal Scientific and Technical Advisor, overseeing a vast array of information technologies. His expertise and guidance have been instrumental in shaping the science and technology portfolio of the Information Directorate. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Linderman. Thanks, Mike. Um, we, a few directors ago, uh, George Ducek was the director of the lab, and he would say it takes 20 years to become an overnight success. And I think in the quantum, we're about 10 years into that journey. And, you know, really kind of exciting about what successes we're poising uh, the Air Force, the DOD, and the nation uh, to advance. So first of all, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the organizers of this, of this event in bringing some of the best and brightest of the world uh, bring their minds to bear in this really fascinating uh, research area of quantum. You know, as we look back over that 10 years, it started, at least in my mind, it started with a very small group of people that worked with the Army and the Navy to get some seed funding, a, a program called ARAP, which is taking things that are so high risk that the service labs themselves might not be willing to invest, take that big a risk. And quantum really became, to me, the uh, kind of the archetype of that model succeeding. Where we brought, we started with this small cadre and with that funding bringing in postdocs and faculty members and then hiring on uh, full-time folks and growing that team. And, and some, after that funding kind of went away, the laboratory picking up some of that funding to keep it going while all the time that group was building a network of support, not just in the academic community, but also with important funding agencies and partners like the local university systems and the congressional staffers. And now we're sustaining this at a level that would be unimaginable if it was just the Air Force Research Laboratory working by itself. And so this has just been to me a stellar success in building a community and then expanding out nationally and internationally uh, as we are today is just inspiring. One of the things as the chief scientist I'm really interested in is how we build that culture of, of scientific and engineering expertise. And the group, the quantum group is, let's be frank, a bunch of physicists and mathematicians in a sea of engineers because most of what we have are computer scientists and engineers. And it's just great to see how that community is not just thriving, but has an influence over the entire organization in seeing what is possible. What does true science really look like? And what are the questions that they ask? And, and, and as exciting, maybe to the engineers and us, I'm an engineer, is what are we going to be able to build with this? maybe 10 years from now, as these things start to become more practical in a wider array of, of environments. And so I'm thankful for uh, how this community, your community, 
is, is helping us kind of see the excitement of, of true science in our organization. So thank you very much for coming. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Pat Roach, who I think you're coming up next here, uh, who's the chief scientist at AFOSR. And this, again, is a great opportunity for the applied side, the, the, the air, here the Rome Air Force uh, Research Laboratory Information Director is a little, tends to be on, more on the applied side, dovetails with the basic science, which is the part, the, ro the role of AFOSR to lead. And so, Pat, come on up. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you guys have a great, a great uh, third day, last day to your, your conference. Well, good morning. Um, I'm supposed to advance the slides here. Here we go. Oh, right. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. One must be smarter than the equipment they're working with, so, uh, and I claim neither of those things. I am the Chief Scientist for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and good morning to you. Glad to see you all here. Uh, hopefully, we're going to talk about basic science and why that's important. Uh, I'm going to talk about its importance uh, certainly to the Department of the Air Force, but I think more importantly to, to the nation at large and, and why we even got into that business to begin with. So uh, let me sort of get right into the talk and figure out how to make this even worse than it is. The Air Force Research Laboratory, as Mark I alluded to, uh, is an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem where Dr. Mike Haddock, Dr. Mark Linderman, and others here at RI uh, basically lead the information science directorate, but there's other directorates. There is the basic research directorate, which is AFOSR, and of course the information directorate, but there are other directorates, directed energy, uh, aerospace systems, uh, human performance, right? There's a, a large ecosystem, a and we serve that larger ecosystem in terms of discovery and in terms of the things that need to go out, right? It's foundational in the terms of the work that we do, right? If you're looking for us to win the war today, it ain't going to happen. Uh, we'll try to win the war for you 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now by looking and discovering information that does not exist, right? By taking risks uh, on ideas that to others are completely crazy, right? A and, and giving a young man or woman just starting their career in academia an opportunity to look at how they might view the world or how they might discover some new uh, nuances that occur there. I'm not alone today, uh, I, and I am certainly by no stretch of the imagination uh, the brightest guy in my group. Uh, that's my POs, my IPOs, who you're gonna be, talk are gonna be talking to you in just a minute. Those are the smart, bright folks. That's the rich wealth that AFOSR brings to the table. But let me talk a little bit more about that uh, ecosystem uh, to you. Uh, our mission is to discover, shape, champion, transition, high-risk, basic research. I've kind of said that generically without regurgitating it here. But at that core mission, right, is this long-term perspective uh, that we have to maintain. Our influence spans 60 world-class subject matter experts. We manage over 1,200 grants and over 200 leading academic institutions uh, across the entire global system, right? And I'll talk more about those statistics. Uh, we are a very small organization with a very big mission and are 71 years of, of old at this stage of the game. Uh, we do that in a small uh, and, and, and in meaningful way, uh, right? We actually do that in terms of the Department of the Air Force and its mission, right? Looking for those things. Well, how do you know what the right discovery ought to be for the Air Force? And the answer is that's not the right way to look at that. It's finding the discovery and saying, is this discovery something that's of interest to Dr. Haddock, to Dr. Lindemann here at the Information Center, and can they take with their higher level, right, applied view of the world, take that information and make that into something? And that's the question. And that's how that ecosystem works exquisitely well. Uh, and then there's lots of examples on how that works. We also are part of building scientists and engineers, right? and business professionals, right? A lot of people think, well, you only fund academia. Do, do, how many of you were here for Jamil's talk on the first day, yeah, right? He mentioned AFOSR, and that's a company. So industry, we do fund industrial discovery. We do fund 
companies that are in the business of actually trying to make those discoveries. So that ecosystem is just not academic. It's largely academic, but that's not the only part of what we do. Again, we're a global network, right? And I'll talk more about where we're located and how we're located uh, across the globe. So if you look, our main office is in Arlington, Virginia, as Mike said earlier, right? Uh, we started off out of World War II in two locations. The first one was in London, right? That's, our, that's where our headquarters, and that's where our director for international uh, work occurs with uh, Colonel uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Russell, who, who leads the global effort on our, uh, uh, on our behalf, uh, and also Tokyo, right? That was the second part uh, that we had at the Hardy Barracks at the end of World War II, but we have expanded since then into places like Santiago, Chile, which I just visited about a month and a half ago uh, for the first time and got to go up into the Andes Mountains into a region near Vicuña, right? Uh, Jim Lyke was with me, who's sitting here, is going to be talking in just a little bit. And we got to see the observatories. They treat that entire region of observatories uh, like they do a world uh, heritage site. So all nations can actually participate in observing right, uh, the Milky Way and constellations and stars uh, within the heavens. And we have several effort, uh, efforts that are going on, uh, one of which is we got to visit uh, the uh, Rubin site. Uh, which is going to actually look at measuring dark matter and dark energy within the universe. And we don't know yet what that's going to bring because it's not yet quite operational, but it's very, very close, right? It was exciting to see those things. That investment to that site is from the Department of Energy and from the National Science Foundation. So there's a lot going on in the world that we need to be paying attention to. Why Chile? It's, it's geographic location. Why a World Heritage Site for observation? Because it is, it is light dead, meaning that they have the right environment to look into the heavens without any light background, you know, overwhelming that and taking that information away from them. We've just stood up uh, a new office in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Again, that's where Dr. Like is coming out of, uh, and in Melbourne, Australia. So we are becoming very almost ONRG, like I wouldn't go that far. They're, they're everywhere, right? But we're getting pretty close. Uh, and so our ecosystem stretches across the globe completely. Sometimes I make the joke that the, the, the sun never sets on AFOSR or AFRL for that matter at this stage of the game. Um, what do we do with science? Uh, AFRL, AFOSR sets you know, and leads entirely new research directions pushing the boundaries of conventional knowledge, right? I can sum that up by saying discovery is everything, right, uh, in terms of the new technology. You may say, well, you know, where does AI come from? What's that whole idea behind that? Where's the idea of quantum come from? A partnership occurred a few years back, uh, I believe, t Tim um, Lawrence, Tim, Dr. Dr. Lawrence, you still here by any chance? Gone? Uh, tell you what, here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, started that whole effort. That was a joint effort with RI and AFOSR and others to put this together. Uh, Tatiana Kerchik for AFOSR in the early days of getting the quantum portfolio put together and then Grace Metcalf coming along and really force functioning uh, a lot of what we see today and really in that partnership is, is going to remain there because of the goodness that comes out of it. But we also align uh, our research strategy in current and future air and space force needs. And I just said that space force, right? We are one laboratory basically serving two services now. And we have real issues with space that I believe all the things that you've talked about so far will translate very easily into the mission that space is doing right now, right? And I'm sure if we, uh, we talk to, to Dr. Haddock and Dr. Linderman, we'll find out there's a lot of effort already undergoing, uh, uh, underway that supports the Space Force and the Space Force mission uh, going forward. And that would just become more and more and more as time goes on. We're really excited about that, uh, so much so that AFOSR pivoted their portfolio to support Space Force in a real way by hiring a space science architect to help us, help us uh, really move out and partner really well with Space Force in terms of their basic science needs. How we accomplish our mission, uh, basic research with tr through traditional grants. That's our bread and butter, right? It's, it's grants going out to universities and to industry, right, on ideas uh, that 
may be really wild. Uh, we use the Young Investigator Program uh, that you may have heard of, which allows us to fund for the first time uh, young investigators at the assistant professor level at universities across the country. That's primarily uh, an American or national program. We're just starting a new program Dr. Linderman and I talked about this morning called ProtoStar in AFOSR, which is to build a young investigator type program within the laboratory. So if you're finishing a postdoc in the laboratory or you're just finishing your PhD and you want to come to the laboratory, there are opportunities if you got some wild ideas in relation to what's going on in the TD, but we can actually fund you to do research for three years under this ProtoStar program. And that's, I think that's going to be a big boon to us in the future and getting new blood in, 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 into our ecosystem. Uh, again, strengthening an air, air and Space Force research capabilities, uh, that is one of our main missions through the LRIR, Laboratory Research Initiative Program, that we actually mon manage. Uh, Dr. Leslie Blaha is my deputy here from AFOSR, and those are her programs. Uh, uh, to, to, to really manage and push hard. Every year we ask the laboratory to provide proposals to us, just like we do with universities across the country, but to do basic research. Uh, and, and, and that is a big enterprise to put all that together and get out. And so getting an LRIR uh, to continue doing basic research uh, in the laboratory is a big, a big part of our mission. Expanding Air and Space Force academic research. I just mentioned the YIP program. One of the efforts that's going on right now is to be very, very proactive with historically black and minority uh, uh, universities and colleges and tribal colleges. Uh, you may say, well, why? Have you looked at the statistics lately of the numbers of American students that are entering STEM programs? I would say we're at the parapet of a strategic criticality because a lot of our kids are not entering into uh, the STEM disciplines, right? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's a real thing. So we must go out to universities and colleges where we have those folks, right, and in great numbers. So I taught at Delaware State University in the physics department, which is a historically black university. Uh, every, almost all of my kids in astronomy were uh, American. When I went to Vanderbilt University to the Department of Engineering, uh, Biomedical Engineering, I would say 70% of our student population was non-American. So a complete difference, right? We have to get more of our folks engaged. We have to get more uh, uh, of our talent into the pipeline and into our laboratory system, and that's the intent of those programs. We are standing up what is called the National Portal uh, uh, Program. Uh, specifically designed to target HBCU MSI TCs uh, for the future for basic science, and that program is in a is in a um, uh, is in a is in a, um, a preliminary uh, look right now. We we have a BAA out that went out. Uh, we've had several responses, about 37 responses to that BAA, specifically designed to get at those universities uh, with specific areas of interest. Workforce development can't say enough about that. I sort of alluded to that. We think that that's part of our uh, charge as well as to get folks into the laboratory uh, and to actually have a place for them to have an environment where they can do basic research uh, for discovery. Strengthen academic research capabilities. Uh, there are several programs that are out there that universities can utilize called DURIP uh, for uh, all kinds of uh, equipment purchase, right? A lot of times with grants, there's not a lot of money, but a Durup, for example, from OSD uh, can provide a PI near a million dollars in equipment purchases at that university. So if you're already funded, as an example, if you're a faculty member here today, if you're already funded by AFOSR on a grant, talk to your program manager, ask them, can I do a Durup, right? And I bet they'll say yes, and tell them why you want to do that DURUP and how that may be related to your research. So annually, these DURUPs come out. We do a call on the DURUPs. So apply, apply, apply. Technology transition, we do this through AFWorks nowadays and SpaceWorks, which is SBIRS, TTR, just the same as, as Mike and, and, and Mark do. Uh, and so we try to jockey to get numbers that we can actually apply for STTR, SBIR, and we do have programs uh, in this arena. So if you're, again, if you're a principal investigator within our system nationally and you have an idea about a small business creation or a technology creation, give your PO a talk, 
uh, ask them, hey, I've got an idea about taking technology I've been researching and taking that to something worthwhile. So that sort of gives you the overview uh, message of, of our system a little bit. Our strategic partnerships, Department of Defense is certainly one of the largest strategic uh, partnerships that we have, certainly academia and other government agencies and industries such as the National Laboratories, the National Science Foundation. We have several MOUs with the National Science Foundation interactively working with them, especially in material science and other things. Uh, you know, we don't have $11 billion in research money, right? We operate somewhere around a half a billion a year uh, and we think we drew a pretty good job of working with that on behalf of the Air Force. Uh, and so we're not the big dog in terms of amounts of money. But we are, and to some degree, if you look at the statistics, the big dog when it comes to discovery. If you look very carefully at how NSF invests their money, there is some discovery. But primarily, it's within centers of excellence to create new technologies, a lot of engineering. So again, discovery is part of what we do, right? and engineering is part of what NSF does. These are the areas that we focus on. Uh, these are our primary uh, portfolio areas, including our international offices. Uh, you can ask some of the guys that are here, uh, Dr. Dudley, uh, Dr. Like, about how their portfolios are set. They manage a hodgepodge of stuff because in our international offices we got one person, right? And so they cover a watersh watershed of areas of interest in terms of basic science, right? And so uh, we cover a big swath of, of real estate uh, looking at these portfolios. These uh, slides can be available. They're public um, uh, affairs uh, distribution A, so they're able to be sent out to everybody. Uh, but these are the areas you'd look at. I would suggest people that are interested in broad agency announcements or our FOAs, right? Uh, our funded areas of, of, of interest, um, you know, you'll find connection to these portfolios, these areas of interest, and these are where you apply. There'll be a name associated with it, which will either be an international program officer, a program officer, or a program coordinator uh, in Arlington or globally that you can reach out to and talk to about, is this something that you're interested in? So pathways to talent. There's several different ways that we try to get at talent across uh, the entire um, uh, academic ecosystem with legacy programs uh, that we've had in STEM. We're building STEM program like we've never done it before uh, in terms of, of AFOSR and trying to be more proactive in building a STEM program uh, for K through 12. We also uh, manage the National Defense and Science and Engineering Fellowship Program. Uh, I would suggest that especially if you're faculty and you have graduate students, this is a heck of a program to apply to. It pays for the PhD for three full years. Right, it's a lot of money. Uh, I can tell you, when I was a poverty-stricken graduate student, I'd love to have some of that to to to, to support myself on. Uh, those <laughs> those didn't exist during my time, but they do today. So apply, apply frequently. Um, uh, I can't say enough good about them. We have awards to stimulate support for undergraduate research called the Assure Program, which is a partnership with the National Science Foundation. Uh, and, and, and we have a thing called Smart Scholars. If you want to know more about Smart Scholars, that's usually TD dependent. And these two gentlemen right here, I would try to, try to tackle them before they get out the door and say, how is your smart, smart program work, right? But that's something that you can really do. And we try to also help in that smart program uh, where appropriate. Uh, young Investigators Program I mentioned earlier, uh, Defense University Research and Instrumentation, the Dura Program for, for, for different things. But these two right here, to me, are really, really important in terms of uh, providing workforce development. The first one is uh, uh, the Summer Faculty Fellowship Program. I'm kind of doing them upside down. Uh, this is something that every TD has the opportunity, funded by us, to provide academics into the laboratory for the summer and to include, and to include their students, right? to come here, let's say, for the summer and work. And if you've seen the facilities that are available back here, right, through the Griffiths Institute, man, that, I, if I were a grad student today, I would say, hey, I'd like to try to do that. That'd be a cool thing to do for the summer. So uh, that happens at every TD, but especially this one. So if you want to know what they're looking for in terms of summer faculty, please give them a shout out. Uh, also, the, the, um, the Science and Technology Fellowship Program, or what we used to call the old 
uh, National Research Council program, which is still underwritten by the National Academy of Sciences. This is a huge deal, right? Uh, and we have plenty of slots right now since COVID, you know, things kind of went down tremendously, but we have opportunities in the laboratory right now. If you are just about to finish your PhD or know someone is about to finish your PhD, please talk uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, some of these folks here. Also, and they'll, they can get in touch with us, but also out on the website at the NRC website. And I have a whole bunch of URLs and QRC codes at the end that'll also help you track all those things down. But reach out and ask about them. They're great fellowships. They, they can go from one to three years within the TDs uh, doing basic research, right, on a, on a funded proposal that you write. We actually uh, allow these quarterly, so you can have up to four times a year where you can actually apply for these fellowships. Uh, it sort of depends on the TD and what they're looking for because they write a description as to what it is they want to, f to actually have a person do, and they have a mentor then also associated with that. But that's a great program. Also, I want to say we just upped the dollars on that program. So we were maybe at one point we'd sort of skirted along and we we're the lowest paid uh, fellowship <laughs> there probably was in the entire government. And so we made a decision this year to at least become average. So we're upwards. Uh, we're, we're, we're approaching the average amount of salary for a postdoc across the, across the ecosystem. So more money uh, getting paid out. So it's a good deal. Right. So we are located globally, as I said before. This gives you a snapshot really quick of the countries that we're involved in. We do this at the end of the year because you know, as the fiscal year is going along, we really don't know what the statistics will look like until we hit 30 September. We can go back and look at the previous year very carefully and say these are the hardcore cold numbers. So for FY22, AFOSR supported 485 national research projects across 47 countries, totaling about 42 million in FY22. If you look like at our national uh, uh, part of that for FY22, uh, 1,060 domestic research projects at 203 universities and small businesses in 44 states, totaling around $240 million. So it's a pretty, pretty large investment based upon our core, our core funding. Why we do what we do. Basic research leads to new knowledge, provides science capital, it creates the fund from which practical applications and knowledge must be drawn. I can't foot stomp that enough. I think you get that, but I'm not sure everybody does because it's always what have you done for me lately kind of thing. Um, and I kind of want to talk to that as we talk about a little bit about the history of the Air Force and why does the Air Force care about discovery and science? Why are we in this business, right? Why is that important? Uh, we've done this for quite a long time. As I said, we started off with Hap Arnold and, 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 and Dr. Von Karman sort of setting this up at the end of World War II. Also the first scientific advisory board, right? These are pictures that all of us see all the time and go, yeah, I've seen that before. I know, I know what those guys look like. Uh, but uh, it's really important to understand where this kind of comes from, right? This is, uh, this is our original office in Baltimore, Maryland, right, for the, for the Office of Scientific Research 71 years ago. Uh, I think it's kind of an interesting picture. I wish we were in that building today. It's kind of a cool building, right? Um, but the reason we got into this business was after looking and participating in two horrific wars, right, especially the second one, by the end of, end of uh, 44, we sort of faced a dilemma in the Pacific, especially when the Germans were no longer in the war, right, when they were out because of primarily we were going it alone in Japan. And the reason I bring this up is because if you're part of the Air Force ecosystem, you also heard this thing, accelerate or lose, this, this buzz phrase. Well, if you look at this very carefully, we had to accelerate or lose because we were losing thousands and thousands of young men and women uh, in the far-flung Pacific during the end of World War II. And this was an operation that was planned for the invasion of uh, Honshu uh, in Japan of 45, which would have cost, the estimation was a million deaths uh, just on landing on the beaches to begin to retake uh, the home islands of Japan. Let's go back a little bit in history. So 84 is really when Becquerel sort of discovered this whole idea of ionizing radiation, right? But then it's really 19, excuse me, it's 18, um, it's really uh, 1895 when the first written discovery uh, by um, uh, Rinkin came out, right? And he first coined the phrase 
X-ray, unknown radiation, right? X-ray. I don't know what it is. I'll call it an X. If you fast forward and look at what happened in 1911, you find the first Solvay Congress bringing together the greatest minds in Europe to talk about this new technology, the potential of it. Was there a potential? If any of you kn in here know, Solvay was a chemist and a Belgian industrialist, and he wanted to use this new discovered technology, right, to, to, to do something new with it. What could it be used for? How can I make some money off of it? Right? And that's not a bad thing necessarily, it's just that was the thing. One of the things that occurs to us immediately when we look at the Solvay Congress, which went on into the 20s, there's not a single American scientist in this meeting at all. Not a one. We're not at the table. We are not in the business of discovery. There's Compton, there's Milliken, there's other folks, other things going on, but we're just not in the business that these guys are into, these men and women. We fast forward to April 3rd, 1944. Dr. Vannevar Bush is an MIT engineer, and he's a direct science advisor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He says to Roosevelt in 44, this whole idea of maybe doing something with this ionizing radiation, we shouldn't invest in this at all. This is not going to be important to us. Oh, did I mention the discovery of quantum mechanics as we're going through this diatribe here? Right? Anyway, I should mention that since this is a quantum uh, thing. In 19, uh, in 19, sorry, in 1940, he tells Roosevelt, we shouldn't be in this business. By 1941, after December 7th, he says, we have to be in this business. In 1945, on July 16th, at the Trinity site in New Mexico, the device is actually put into action, right? It's tested. I don't, I'm not going to get into the should we have used it, should we not have used it in August. I'm not going to talk about that. But what I am going to talk about, it took 50 years after the discovery to put that into a technology. How long has it taken for you to reach the point about quantum where you are today? Right? Where did that come from? This is not overnight for us. We see the long term. We want you to see, in many ways, the short term. But we also need you to understand that without what we're trying to do in terms of discovery, you don't have that information to create that technology that may cha be the game changer. Right? These are the two men that we owe our existence to in the Air Force Office of Scientific Research because they lived that, those days, the, that war. And they saw that discovery was absolutely incredible. Hap Arnold writes here, he says, the technical genius which could find answers was not cooped up in military or civilian bureaucracy, but was to be found in universities and in the people at large. I think those are really important words to think about, right? When we think about how our science is affecting our technology for today and tomorrow. Theodore von Karman, the consummate engineer, the scientist describes what is, and the engineer creates what never was. Beautiful comment, right? During that time, we bring out our Nobel laureates, like NSF brought out their Nobel laureates. We've had 86 of them uh, since our inception. Uh, and we don't just sort of parade them out. Uh, we actually talk about the fact that we funded them before they did the research that garnered the Nobel Prize like this gentleman here, Charles Towns. Or this gentleman here, Stephen Chu. Or this gentleman here, David Wineland at NIST. Right. So I'm not going to get into the details of some of the talk here that, that, that Dr. Dudley and, and Dr. Like are going to talk about, but these are what are things that are going on, let's say, overseas right now, right? And this one at Oxford University in quantum photonics. And you look at the timeline when we first look at the first investment right here on the left-hand side of this. I'll try to point to it. Try to point to it as best I can, see if that works. No, nope. don't look at it with your remaining good eye. Oh, did I screw something up? Looks like it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Ah, I have it. 
So this is where it begins here. Dr. Dudley can talk more to a lot of this. And you look at the litany. Now, this is an eye chart, right, to have to read through. You can't necessarily read it out there and get everything in there. But the point is, you start here in 2008, and this is where you are today in 2003. And I'll let him describe more of the great science that's going on here. But it, from what I can see right here, this is optic letters, right, in October of 2022, and Zeman optical pumping of rubidium atoms in hollow core photonic crystal fibers. How long did it take from here to here? And how much longer will it take to get to the next discovery and the next discovery as long as we keep trying and understanding there's discovery to be had? Mouse pad, he said mouse pad, use mouse pad. Uh, help. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just finish. You're on it. <laughs> help. So I hope if I've left you with anything is not the horror of war. That was not the intent. The intent was to leave you with the idea that to discover something and put it to make it useful, whether it's a military purpose or a civilian purpose, takes a very long time to realize. You know, I think when I was a grad student and I was a scientist, I wrote on the backs of others in terms of the discoveries they made to the things that I did in the laboratory. I believe that's what each of us do. And it took men and women quite some time ago to find the things that we all need to understand to go forward, right? Um, such as the technology that you're working with. <laughs> Ah, all right, some things do work. Got it. All right. So again, uh, I'm not going to belabor this other than to say, if you look at the beginnings of this, we're now in 2021 uh, for quantum photonics at the University of Bristol, right? This is what I love about the guys in the international office. They timeline this entire process right here and all the things that go into it to the best ability before it can be realized uh, and made into something that's useful. So lastly, I did say that, that you can connect with AF AFOSR, you can connect with AFRL. I encourage you to do so. We are a very proud laboratory at the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, we have a lot of rich history uh, since, its, since its inception and beyond that, right, where we come from and in our DNA. Um, and, uh, you know, again, there's all kinds of ways to find us. But I would like to say we would love for you to join us and be part of our ecosystem. I do have to speak on behalf of my TD and say that we are AFOSR and we science and ask you for your questions and thank you for your time. Good morning. I'm Larry Merkel from the Air Force Institute of Technology. As I'm sure you can tell us stories about, uh, the leadership support for basic research fluctuates over time, so I'm wondering if you can comment on what you foresee as future trends in that regard. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, and thank you, and, and thank you for, for your service at AFIT. Um, great partnership with AFIT, by the way. Really enjoy it. Um, Everything is about what have you done for us lately, and I understand that. I understand that pressure like everyone else does, like Mike does and like Mark does. I mean, we get it. Uh, you know, our, our young men and women, we want to provide them with technology and get them home safe and sound and to their families, right? That's, that's really important. I believe that there is a future for, for discovery to continue. I believe that Hap Arnold and, and Von Karman made those decisions based upon their understanding of what was most horrific about what they had just been through, and that in order for us to be a first world economy, for, in order for us to be a first world uh, power, that discovery has to be part of that ecosystem. If you look at competitor states, and I won't name any, but there's lots of competitor states, like 16 if you look at the National Science Foundation site, right? 
you can see the increase in investment of many competitor states in discovery because they understand how important that is to fueling and creating their own economies for the future, right? Very important stuff. I think that we are going to remain. Uh, that's my positive take on it. It goes up and it goes down and it goes up and goes down. But at the end of the day, if you say, what have you done for, oh, basic science hasn't done anything for me uh, in the last 20 years. Quantum, information sciences, directed energy, artificial intelligence, autonomy, trust and influence. Those are five items right there. I didn't say biotechnology. That's part of the DOD priority, right? We brought that to the table. We bring those things to the table, right? They're here now. You're here now, right? Because we made those investments years and years ago. We didn't necessarily understand how they would lead to certain things, right? But without making those investments, we don't have what we have currently right now. That's, that's my feeling. I don't think anyone can, can argue that. If they do, that's, that's their choice. I, I, I get that. But, but I can't imagine that they would be so narrowly focused not to understand how important it was to have that information so that engineers can create our future. Right. Does that answer your question? I hope. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you all so very much. Okay. Awesome talk by Dr. Roach. So next we're going to continue our AFOSR theme here, and we're going to uh, have a session now uh, focusing on our international offices. So first up, uh, we're going to have three speakers there representing uh, three of our offices. First up will be Dr. Jim Like, who is our international project, who is an international project officer at AFOSR's Southern Office of Aerospace Research and Development. In uh, he's based in um, Brazil. Dr. Like's expertise is in advanced packaging, communications, and space systems, and has led to numerous advancements in these domains. So with that, uh, let me welcome Dr. Like to the stage. There you go. I like the athleticism. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. Well, my my talk. Um, will address um, one of the newest offices of the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Um, so what I'll, what I'll do is I'll just give a, an overview. There'll be some overlap with the last talk, um, but I, I hope to provide some perspective um, on, on this newer office. Um, I also hope I can just give, uh, I'll, I'll also feature just briefly some of the quantum efforts. I won't really go into them in detail, but you'll you have heard from one yesterday, and you'll hear from a couple more uh, today. And I'll, if I have time, I'll just give kind of a glimpse of, of my own thoughts about future, because I, I think it really is about, well, what is, the next, what is the next big thing? What will the advancements in quantum allow us to do? What is the future of Moore's Law? So, so um, you've already gotten in, in much more eloquent words than I can say the, um, the, the, what the Air Force Research Lab is. Uh, we have the, the many tech directorates. I myself came from the Space Vehicles Directorate. I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, up to the point where I left uh, the U.S. at the end of last year to uh, work in the, um, uh, the, 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 the IOS office down in Brazil. But we are the research arm of the, the U.S. Air Force, and uh, we, um, we have an impressive uh, team across the country. And with AFOSR in the basic research role, we span the globe. Um, so I like the idea that the sun never sets on, on the AFRL. Um, I also won't um, belabor, but I think it's, ext well, I, it is very important that we understand basic research. 
Um, this is a conversation I have often in Latin America because a lot of the research there is applied because it's driven by, for example, industries such as oil gas is a very significant influence in, in Brazil. Um, and basic research is, is about that, that idea of discovery. I, I think it's, I, I, I kind of see it in my own work as the tension between discovery and design. Um, what are the things that made us excited to become research scientists and engineers? Those sparks um, underlie, I think, that nature of discovery. Um, we seek great ideas wherever they are. Um, and I, I, as I learn more and more about Latin America, there is a vast potential there, and, and we're uh, trying to tap, tap into that. But we, I had a chance to meet the, uh, the only fields medalist in South America. It was in a, in a small research group called IMPA in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, very, very exciting. I, I, just, I just see a lot of potential. Um, but there's many quotes about basic research. I, I think one I like, I won't get it completely, completely right, but it's something to the effect that if we didn't have uh, basic research, we'd still be building sharper spears. And uh, we, um, you know, we, we need to always be pushing the, the idea of what, what's novel, what, what's next. And it, it's not always with the idea that there's an application in mind. Those applications for great ideas will, will happen. Um, one of the things, and I, I do this partly for the benefit, we do have some international visitors here. They do not understand, <laughs> probably as well as we take for granted, the, the, un the structure of, of our research taxonomy in the Department of Defense. Uh, so I, um, you know, I, I, the rest of us, this is boring. We, we live this all the time, but I just want to explain a couple of scales really quickly. And one of them, uh, where the thermometer is, is the technology readiness level. So the TRL is this infamous uh, idea that John Mankin, who was formerly from NASA, came up with um, uh, a while back. And the technology readiness level goes from one to nine. And we, in AFOSR, we swim in the TRL one uh, uh, lane pretty, pretty much. Um, when I was in Space Vehicles Directorate, we worked in the higher TRLs. Um, if you are building a satellite or an aircraft, but, but in space in particular, we, we don't like to touch anything below TRL 6, just to give you an idea. So getting from that um, technology readiness level from 1 to 6, um, you encounter things like the so-called valley of death, which is, refers to this technological chasm. So often you can get ideas to a certain point, but they don't quite yet make it into an aircraft or spacecraft. So, so spanning that, and I feel like I've navigated the fine structure of that valley of death often in my, my career trying to figure out how to get an idea I was working on into something like a spacecraft. So that's the TRL scale, and that, that's, um, that actually is more well-known than the other um, rubric, which is in the upper right, which is the, um, the, the, the six dot X um, <laughs> nomenclature. So analogous to the TRL, six dot one is what we call basic research. Um, for reference, um, in the Air Force Research Lab, we, we have research going from six one, six two, six three, um, all of the 6.1 research is owned by AFOSR, so we, um, we basically control that budget. It's, it's a good budget. It's not, I don't know the numbers, but it, it's not nearly as large as the other parts of the AFRL budget. So we want to make sure that we make that budget count. We want to do everything that we can to, to really fund uh, you know, only the most exciting, the best, the best ideas, wherever they are. Um, as we get into 6.2, 6.3, so DARPA, a lot of the 6.2 money, so much bigger dollars, but um, it's advanced research, and of course then the, the rubric goes up. So if you ever hear people talking about 6.2 budgets or 6.1 budgets, that's, that's what that means. And you can sort of relate it to that TRL idea, although it's not really an exact mapping. So I, I, I you know, I wanted to just identify this because I know this is old hat for most of us, but there are a few people who have never heard these ideas before. And when I'm in Latin America, I actually find a lot of people don't know what TRL is, and I thought that was universal uh, of an idea. But, but anyway, 
Um, I won't um, go into the, the, I think there's like about 36 portfolios. The, these represent um, sort of a reflection of the research interest in the Air Force Research Lab. We, we like to be quick to say that while this is a, a type of bending of interest and ideas, it is not an all-inclusive rubric. Um, there are always, and in fact, I think in basic research, we have to be open to the widest uh, potentiality of ideas. But, but sometimes we do get asked the question, well, what are you really in interested in? And we say, well, um, we as remote um, uh, reflections of the Air Force Research Lab and AFOSR, we, our interests reflect what the rest of the lab is interested in. We do have our own backgrounds, we do have our personal interests, but as Dr. Roach said, there's, there's a small number of us. We cannot possibly put, for example, one individual uh, from each of these boxes down in South America or Australia. Um, so we, we have to basically um, navigate the spectral sharpness of our own personal interest and the genericness of the rest of a rubric like this. Um, again, in, in overlap, um, this, this, this idea was covered, but we have international offices in um, many locations. The first was in London, in, in the, the European office. Um, obviously the Asian office in Tokyo. We have two offices in Latin America. I uh, and uh, Colonel Greenwood are in the Sao Paulo office in Brazil. Um, we also have an office in Santiago, Chile. Um, and, and we are o opening an office in, in Australia. So we, we, try to, we try to place um, international offices in the major spheres um, and certainly I'm, I'm proud and, and happy to be uh, working in the, um, the Latin American office, South America. Our office is small, and this is, this is the office, and it's actually just now getting a little bit smaller. So here, here are us, and um, Colonel Chris Carson, I, I sort of started to gray that out because he's actually um, leaving Santiago. He's the SWORD director. Um, as he departs, um, Colonel uh, Roger Greenwood, who works with me uh, uh, in Sao Paulo, will be, be running uh, SWORD. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Maribel Harmon is in Santiago. I'm in Sao Paulo. And our assistant, Caddy Maldonado, uh, is doing excellent support for us in the Santiago office. So with that small group, and we're, we're in the process of, of trying to expand, but um, this, th th this, this is our um, basically uh, workforce in, in South America. We, um, so now I'll shift a little bit into in how we work with, um, how we work with people in Latin America or how they can work with us. Um, our primary bread and butter are the grants, the research projects. And so there is a broad agency announcement, so that's our term for a solicitation where you can submit proposals. That, that solicitation is open now, and anyone anywhere in the world is free to pick up a pen or a, a web terminal and, and, and basically put a proposal to, uh, together. We do not recommend that direct of an approach because often um, that, that idea will not be necessarily tuned or receptive to portfolio um, managers or, or to us. So what we recommend instead is this process of what we call the white paper. So think of the white paper as a type of technical abstract, a little bit more um, budgeting details and ideas, so basically scoping out the research project. But that w with that white paper, we will, will typically iterate with research groups. It's a, good, it's a good exercise. Sometimes it's a difficult exercise. We often get ideas that are very good, but they're just not really basic research. So what we try to do is say, and we, we look at them and say, well, if it's not basic research, is there, is there a spark in that idea? Can we iterate and, and find the, the excellence in, in that idea? If, if not, can we find another uh, group in the, one of the technical directorates, you know, the thousands of AFRL people who, or other laboratories who might be interested. So we'll try to help, but we m more or less want to use that white paper to help us focus ideas. When um, we find promising ideas, then we will 
we will look at the possibility of, of supporting that with uh, research funding in the form of a grant. We will then say at this point, why don't you why don't you submit a grant? Why don't you prepare and submit a grant? So now your probability goes from closer to zero to much closer to to, to the hundred percent. So uh, this is a process that we mostly um, live as we do our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, the, so the grants are the primary thing. We also do conference support. So a number of workshops, I know we had one recently, I remember Nanta Fagasta was able to attend, uh, was, was uh, supported um, uh, largely with uh, funding from SWORD, from um, uh, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Uh, we can provide um, support not uh, often we we have um the details matter and i won't get into all of them but some we can only provide a certain percentage like about 30 percent so the mileage will vary sometimes we can partner with our colleagues in the the navy and the uh, army and i i want to i want to mention now because i'll probably forget if i don't is that we work um colonel greenwood and i we work in south america in the offices of the consulate of the state department so across the hall from us, we have two people from the, the Navy, uh, ONR Global, and we also have um, representatives from the Army DEFCON. So in a way, we, we're, we're from different service branches, but we function very fluidly, almost like a little virtual branch. And that's a powerful idea because a lot of times the white papers that we get are, 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 are shared with those colleagues. So, so we, you'll see often joint, and a couple of ones I'll mention, are jointly funded by uh, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and ONR Global. And, I, I, and that's a great thing. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to, to do that. It's, it's very easy for us in this manner to do joint programs. Um, Getting, getting back to here, the other mechanism that we use is something called the Windows on Science program. So this is a mechanism I use to, to be able to sponsor um, attendees from Brazil to come to this workshop. When we find, um, if, if you are in the AFRL technical directorates and you see a researcher that you're very interested in, in Brazil, Argentina, um, et cetera, you know, let us know. Perhaps we can help you get that researcher um, brought to the U.S. and that is a very powerful that that may actually be one of our best mechanisms because I, I know when I was in the technical directorates I used that mechanism and I, I built very large programs from one Windows on Science visit it turned into grants project agreements um, so the Windows on Science is very powerful because it brings the researchers from foreign countries into our laboratories where they can interact and, and it's 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 almost always a great thing. So um, I, I really am glad that we have that tool, the Windows on Science. Um, I'm, I'm going to spotlight. I will not go into detail because you're gonna, you, you saw posters on some of these and you're going to hear talks and you've already heard a talk. But I just want to uh, plug and just make, make you aware of some of the projects that, that we are supporting. And, and there's there's more, but but these are these are sort of the quantum theme um, talks. You're going to hear a talk later today on something called a, a quantum optimized path forest framework. So this is taking a classic graph theory problem, for which the expertise came from um, São Paulo, Brazil. So this this idea of a optimum path forest framework was was invented essentially by João pa Papa in at San Jose, and um, what they're going to do in this, uh, in this effort, and this is one of those joint programs, actually the Navy is leading the grant and we're contributing to it. Um, we're gonna look at applying quantum methodologies, quantum algorithms, quantum machine learning to look at what we can do with this classic problem. And since they um, were the pioneers of this, they're in the best um, position to understand the, the um, the amount of goodness or improvement that quantum methods could provide to this classic problem. It's, an, it's one of those you know, well-known NP-hard problems that if we, if we can do something to help it, it probably translates into helping a lot of other difficult uh, computation problems. Yesterday you, you heard uh, Anderson's excellent uh, talk on Synalgebraic Quantum Simulator Frameworks. Um, some very creative, very out-of-the-box thinking on um, on difficult problem of quantum simulation without ha always having the quantum computer um, in your um, 
backyard to uh, work work on. And and later today, you're, you're going to hear um, also from uh, Antonio Vidiella on, on the quantum entanglement in m microtoroidal resonators. Um, Dr. Vidiello works at Campinas, which is within the state of Sao Paulo, and I, I think one of the reasons that we're in Sao Paulo is it is sort of an epicenter, if you say, where, where is a lot of research being done in Latin America. A lot of it's being done in Brazil. Within Brazil, a lot of it's being done in, San, uh, in, in the Sao Paulo uh, region. So the, all the researchers I'm talking about here are from the, the state of Sao Paulo, very close, um, very um, um, near where, where I wor work every day. Um, and I, I just, if you will indulge me, I just want to just give a couple of my own thoughts on the future of Moore's Law. And I'm kind of curious about where quantum fits into this. So we, we know classically uh, the idea of Moore's Law. Gordon Moore in 1965 wrote a, wrote a paper. I guess he, he probably didn't realize the impact it would have. It, what, he didn't call it his own law. He, 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 it was an observation about the, eco e the economics of fitting transistors on integrated circuits. But it became something of, of uh, you know, almost a household word. It's this idea that every two years the number of transistors will double. And people are, have, for almost 20 years, have been predicting the end of Moore's Law. But it still kind of keeps going, although, you know, if you, if you get into the details, you can say, well, this aspect of Moore's Law is no longer scaling and so forth. Um, but there are three, um, three ideas. One of them is based on the density, which is the, the number of things I can pack uh, on a chip. The second is the economics, the cost of the transistors. Um, and the third is... is um, I, I feel is an energy-related um, uh, issue about power scaling. So when people say Moore's Law is ending, I, I look at it this way. Um, I have a parking lot. I want to put a lot of cars in it. How many cars can I cram in the parking lot? Well, eventually I'll reach some sort of limit. But if we, if, if we talked about parking lots the way we talk about Moore's Law, we would say, okay, we're done. We can't do anything more. We've put all the cars we can on the surface. But that's not how things work. And if you go to Sao Paulo, you'll see that right away. Many, many high-rise buildings, multi-level parking lots. We have a whole third spatial dimension that we've barely been, been able to tap into. And if we, if we look at that third dimension the way we look at the second dimension, we actually have 40 to 50 more years of Moore's Law. So we have a lot of doublings ahead. And in fact, for reasons I won't belabor due to time, uh, I can make some other arguments about why um, I would say circuits want to be three-dimensional as opposed to two-dimensional. We're actually doing things artificial to circuits by flattening them onto a surface instead of building them in a more natural way. So I don't think Moore's Law is over. I think we will always continue to push for a higher level performance. So people who say Moore's Law are dead, I just don't think they're thinking this expansively enough. Um, so I don't know the consequences of this to quantum, but quantum, as far as I know, does not yet have its own equivalent of a Moore's Law. And I'm, I'm very interested in, in the implications of that, but I, I will, I'll just leave that there. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is, so this is more of the structural aspect of a Moore's Law. The other one is the functional aspect. What do we do with all of that um, uh, capability? What, where is that going? And um, I've done a lot of work in systems for spacecraft, cramming electronics into small uh, compartments and, and studying things like, well, once I build it and fly it, I can't change it. What? So the, 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 the idea called a field programmable gate array is an example of, of a digital system that can be reprogrammed after you build it you know, infinitely. Um, this idea of reconfigurable systems is is a very powerful trend, one that I believe will define many pursuits um, um, over the next you know, century, perhaps. Um, so I, I have on this chart sort of a, a diagram of what I call the, the roadmap of reconfigurable systems. And the yellow stuff is just where we're at today. There's a vast frontier ahead. So I, I'll argue that programmable matter is our, is our ultimate destiny. The ability to software define uh, essentially the relationship between uh, nanoblocks, and I know this sounds very Buck, Roger, Buck Rogers-y, but um, this is about thinking of the future. What is the next thing? And I think this is a very obvious and natural trend of what we're seeing. And you can, you can um, 
I think you can see that by looking at the field programmable gate array. So if you go back to the 1970s, there were these little chips that were called programmable logic arrays or, 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 or programmable array logic PALs, and they were used to fix problems in circuit boards, and they were not considered very elegant, and they were hand programmed. But bring Moore's law to that idea, and you go like 50 years into the future, and now you have these vast platforms, these fabrics of digital magic that you can take anything you can think of and translate that into bit patterns that turn this thing into whatever you want, entire computer arrays if you want. Um, and th that is just what we can do with digital. So that's a software-defined digital system. It's just called an FPGA. It's not a very elegant idea until you really look at it hard and, and, and understand the, the power of that idea. And I think Moore's Law is what took that clunky idea and made it this. So what is Moore's Law, if we have 40 or 50 more years of it, going to do to other things? And I, I think this is, this is something I, I wonder a lot about. And we, we, we see some examples of that. So the virtual computers are essentially computers that pretend to be other computers. So we virtualize the idea of a computer, and that's powerful because every time we watch Netflix, a, a VM is being spun up somewhere to give us that movie. And I can put many VMs on one piece of bare metal. Um, FPGA, as I've already talked about, is a, is a digital circuit that's essentially infinitely redefinable. We have heard about software-defined networks. Those are driving the way that we work. A lot of, maybe a lot of us don't like what it's doing because everything's going into the cloud and, and sometimes we, 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 we still like the physicality that the bits are on my physical hardware. Um, but there's many other things. Software-defined neuromorphic computers, software-defined wiring harnesses, software-defined radios, and software-defined antennas. So this goes on and on. And I think, and I'm going to stop editorializing now because uh, I, I, I know this is a quantum conference, but these ideas also have consequences to, to quantum. And I, I, I am certainly encouraging a lot of creative thought on, on these, these fronts, but this is just my little attempt to editorialize a, about, a bit about the future. My background in history have kind of informed these perspectives. So I'll, I'll wrap up uh, now and thank you for your attention. I, I just want to summarize that, and I, I never actually defined the acronym SWORD, but SWORD is the, is the name, the label of the group I'm in. It is the Southern Office of Aerospace Research and Development. It is a remote arm of the Air Force Office of Research um, and the IOS, the International Office in London, has its tentacles in different parts of the world. SWORD is the part in Latin America, and that's where I work. We have um, spun up at least 300 grant efforts since the inception of, of this office, and um, I've highlighted three activities that you have heard or will hear more about. Um, and our outreach is ongoing. We're looking for, we're, we're hoping to find some Nobel laureates in, in Latin America, and um, there's just a lot, of, I, I think there's a lot of, of, of hope in, in this pursuit. So, so thanks a lot for your time and I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Hello, thanks for your talk. Um, so if the main purpose of having offices around the world is to tap into the talent around the world to uh, leverage um, research development for the United States, or so I, I was just wondering, like, what's the main thought behind how, you, how sites are chosen and what does the AFOSR hope to gain from having offices around the world? Okay, um, I, I'll, I, I, I can pro provide my answer, but I'll certainly defer to Dr. Roach to amend or correct. Um, my, my comments, yes, uh, we, we are there. I mean, we recognized long ago, I think uh, Dr. Roach did some uh, excellent uh, summaries of the, the nature of, um, in, in the history. I mean, we, we realized we can't go alone. Uh, certainly the Manhattan Project would have never succeeded if we said only U.S. scientists can be involved. Um, so we know that we don't corner the market on talent. We, we, and I think that that's a good thing. We, we can all benefit from that. So with basic research in particular, we don't worry about things like classification so much. These are ideas that are, that are, that are raw and pure at some level. Um, and and as, as such, I think that we, um, 
we have a lot more freedom in these international offices to explore creative possibilities. But those ideas, which will maybe benefit everyone, benefit us as well. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, Dr. Roach, if you would add anything. Uh, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. There we go. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Like definitely a lot of um, synergy there with Moore's Law, and as we advance that, look to non-von Neumann architectures. Oops, I hit that. Um, in quantum computing, certainly our quantum computers aren't going to replace traditional computers by any means. They're going to certainly have their niche areas. So we're going to need to really think long and hard how we combine traditional processors, other non von Neumann architectures, favorite of mine, neuromorphic computing, with quantum computing kind of to optimize uh, computing solutions. So with my editorialization done, we now move on to Lieutenant Colonel Michael Richards and International Program Officer at AORD, we'll use that acronym, which is the Asian Office of Aerospace Research and Development. Uh, he joins us today. He plays a pivotal role in building relationships between Asia, AFRL, and U.S. academic institutions. His dedication to fostering collaborations and identifying top Asian scientific expertise is, is very commendable, and I know he's done a lot with uh, our team here in building those collaborations as well. So, Colonel Richards. Good morning. Um, we've been able to hear from Dr. Roach, who talked about AFOSR broadly, uh, and then Jim, who talked specifically about the SWORD office. And I'm going to step down and talk specifically about the quantum portfolio in Asia. Um, so when we say quantum, we all know what we're talking about. But just to be clear, I'm looking specifically at quantum communications, quantum sensing and metrology, quantum computing, and then all the underlying materials that support those technologies and sciences. Um, we heard on Tuesday from Alex, who laid out how important quantum is to the U.S. government, but as Jim pointed out, we're very limited in the number of folks that we have in each of our offices. We have a handful of IPOs in Tokyo, and so it's a legitimate question to ask, should one of them be focused on quantum? And I think what Alex laid out and all the documents that we have here show that the answer to that is yes. Quantum is sufficiently important to take one person, me in this case, even one person like me who doesn't have a background in quantum and say, we need you to run with this portfolio. Uh, and so that's, that's what I do. Um, Jim also kind of laid out how we work together with, with different organizations and different people. Uh, and the answer to the excellent question of, well, why do you guys have overseas offices? Um, I look at it from this perspective. We have all of this great work being done within AFRL uh, over there on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, and then we have a lot of great work that our sister services are doing. And then we have all of this other research being done outside of the United States. And our role as international program officers is to try and help tie some of that together. We have this, this expression, uh, awareness, engagement, and relationships uh, that you saw on Dr. Roach's slide. I'm magically pressing this button. It's really phenomenal. It's like somebody's encouraging me to go faster. Um, but that, that's really what I'm trying to do. I want to find great researchers in Asia and get them connected with our great researchers within AFRL. So, oh, now I want to, there we go. How do we do that? Jim talked about these tools already, so I won't spend much time on them. I'll, I'll make a couple observations. One, within our grants, our, our requirements are really low. Um, when we give someone a grant, we expect them to give us an annual report and a final report. We expect them to report on their finances and then to tell us if they file any patents. But we don't, we don't levy any other requirements on our PIs which comes as a breath of fresh air to a number of the researchers I work with who have all kinds of requirements tied to their grants. In fact, we don't even retain the intellectual property that we paid for. We leave that to the university 
uh, whatever their policy is, whether the PI gets to keep it or the university keeps it. Um, the other two, uh, what Jim said, is, is identical to what we talk about, but uh, there's one other tool that we use in the Asian office that's largely because we've been around longer and we've had some, some really active IPOs who've made them happen, and that is uh, these global initiatives. Now, uh, the term initiative has been used in different ways when it comes to the, the uh, international offices, but when I'm saying it, what I'm talking about is we recognize that there are uh, other countries that are doing specific research that we're really interested in and it looks like there might be some sort of synergy between what their researchers are doing and our researchers are doing and we would really like to get those researchers together and so from the AFOSR side we put out a BAA amplification that basically says we will fund projects that are uh, that have co-PIs one from the US and one from another country so please bring us proposals uh, and so a US researcher will find a for example Korean researcher they will jointly develop a proposal the US researcher will bring me that proposal the Korean researcher will bring their proposal to the Korean government and each of these two different government organizations will rack and stack those projects and then we'll come back together and say do we have alignment anywhere are there any projects that we both wanted to fund and if so, then we do that. We each fund our side of the projects separately, uh, but we require them to work together, and we have annual reviews where they come and report on it. Uh, what's really phenomenal about these projects, or this, this approach, is we are encouraging this uh, international cooperation, uh, but we're making it happen at the university level, so that the governments aren't driving it, aren't, aren't making it happen specifically. And what we find is that research or, or publications that have a US PI and an international PI typically have significantly more citations. They're higher impact publications. Uh, and so that, that really makes us feel good about what we're doing. So with all these tools, what does my portfolio look like? It looks about like this. I've got, oh, it's overlapped a little. That's okay. I've got several projects in Korea and several projects in Australia and then a handful of projects in other countries. Uh, we've also got the Korean Quantum Initiative which I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, and I recently inherited the Singapore Quantum Initiative from uh, uh, a coworker who PCS'd or who, who moved out of the office. All those projects that I have in the US uh, are tied to the Korea Quantum Initiative. Uh, as an IPO, I, I do not fund US PIs. So let's step down into uh, uh, an example project of something that I'm funding. So Gil Cho Young, or Gil Young Cho at the Pohang University of Science and Technology is a uh, theorist. Uh, and we've given him a three-year grant to look at this theoretical investigation of novel solid-state qubit platforms. And he's come up with three and a half or four different platforms that he's looking at to see, can he make qubits, can he make uh, one and two qubit gates to control them. Uh, and so we're going to run through very quickly each of these different platforms. So this first one he talks about is a, a valley type platform. If I take two pieces of um, graphene and stack them on top of each other, I'll, I'll get this kind of quadratic band structure. And if I then place a, put a displacement field perpendicular to it, it will take the minimum and maximum and kind of pull them open, creating these little mini valleys. Uh, and it, it looks like if we control the twist between those two sheets of graphene, uh, we can control the intervalley distance between those mini valleys. And then if we come along and put another uh, electric field uh, parallel to those sheets of graphene, we'll get an energy separation between those two valleys that can be used as different levels for a qubit. And so we're gonna, he's going to continue working on that and see about controlling it. The next platform is interesting. You take a chunk of silicon and cleave it, right? Peel it apart to try and get a nice flat surface. If you're good, you'll get lots of flat surface. But almost regardless of how you do it, you will end up with little stair steps at the edges of that flat surface. And those are called terraces. And along the edge of those terraces, um, those atoms there, they're 
they feel different than the atoms in the bulk of the material or the surface because they just don't have very many neighbors. Two electrons living on those atoms on the edge, that terrace edge, it feels kind of like it's a one-dimensional material. And so we know if we had a, a really thin wire that was conductive and we put charge on it, the charge would spread out and would be equally distributed along that wire. But in this silicon 553 terrace edge, the charge doesn't do that. Instead, it, it gathers together in, in little clumps that form a, a periodic structure of uh, high charge density, low charge density, high charge density, low charge density, and they call that a charge density wave. Now, within this material in particular, there are three degeneracies of this charge density wave, so that essentially you can have three different patterns of how the charge lines up that are all at the same energy level. And Gill has done previous work where he, he took this charge density wave and put it in, the, in a Josephson junction and found that parafermions show up. Um, what the goal at this point is, though, when he did that, it was all idealized. And the question now is if he takes and makes this more realistic, will that, um, so essentially fractionalization of the electrons to get E over 3 charge for each of these energy levels, or not energy levels, but each of these, um, each of these different charge density patterns, will that continue to show up in a more realistic situation? And is there a way that he can then go in and control it as a Qtrit, right? Can he make a one Qtrit gate or two Qtrit gate? The next platform uh, is also pretty interesting. It's basically with topological insulators. The bulk of the material is insulating, but the surfaces conduct, and sometimes they conduct in strange ways. But higher order topological insulators, instead of having the surfaces that conduct, it's again those edges, and you get that 1D effect, either an edge or a hinge on the inside. Uh, and with this uh, tungsten ditelluride material, the edge is what they call a helical edge insulator, which means that the momentum of the electrons and the spin are locked together. So if you have current traveling in one direction, all of the spins will be pointed in the same direction. And if you reverse the current, they'll all be pointed in the opposite direction. Uh, and that's interesting and, and strange to me. Uh, but what's even more interesting is if you then take and put a ferromagnet on it, that will start to mess with those spins, and again, put it within a Josephson junction, that will begin to, to bring out uh, Majorana uh, fermions at the boundaries. And so Gill is looking at that. Uh, there are also several other higher order topological insulator materials that he's looking at to see if they have similar effects and different ways that he can make qubits out of them. Uh, and then the final platform that he's looking at is the grain boundary of uh, molybdenum ditelluride. It has a couple of properties that basically indicate there is some sort of special protected states that, again, if he places those within uh, Joseph's adjunction, then he anticipates that he'll be able to make Andre's spin qubits and hopefully be able to line them up. Uh, it's sequentially connected. Um, now, this, when Gil presented this, it felt, it felt kind of uh, ambitious. Like, can you do all this? Because lots of people have done lots of these things and not done them well. Uh, and, and he expressed a lot of confidence because he is right next door to an experimental lab that works with all of these materials, and they already have this synergistic relationship where Gill will model these things and say, okay, I need this information, and the lab will go and get the information for him, or they will do other experiments and say, hey, we discovered this, and so it's constantly feeding into his models. Uh, so that's an example of one of these projects that I have funded. We're going to step back up out of a project and talk specifically about this initiative that we have with Korea. So we've worked closely with Korea for a long time. Uh, this current initiative started in 2021, but we have had these global initiatives with Korea since 2003. Uh, and as I described, it is basically the U.S. funding the U.S. researchers and Korea funding the Korean researchers. Um, and we have, we have been, we just last week, in fact, had our second annual review on this project uh, and got a lot of um, really positive feedback of what has been accomplished. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to hop to the next slide. 
and say, as an example of one of those projects, um, we have Sung Woo Nam from the University of California in Irvine, uh, and then Hong Gil Park from Korea University. And they're looking at if we have um, heterostructures, right? So two, two different kinds of 2D materials stacked together. And then we put strain in some location in that material. Then excitons tend to migrate to that location of, of tensile strain uh, before they recombine and emit. And the other cool thing that happens in those areas of higher strain is the conduction band drops uh, and the uh, valence band drops, but not as much. So you have a smaller band gap, and that leads to longer wavelength emissions, which is uh, important when the goal is to get to telecommunication wavelengths. And so they've taken this and shown uh, with a nano indenter or a nano uh, FMM, AFM probe, they can make little tiny um, indentations into the material uh, to demonstrate that they do get these localized uh, higher levels of emission uh, with the ultimate goal of making a, a single photon emitter in telecommunications wavelengths. And that is all I've got for you. What questions do you have for me? All right, as Dr. Dudley gets set up, uh, let me introduce him. So Dr. Scott Dudley is an International Program Officer at AFOSR's European Office of Aerospace Research and Development, known as EORD. He's based out of London. And his contributions in managing research and collaborations with European academic institutions has been instrumental in advancing the field of quantum information science. So please, let us welcome Dr. Dudley. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this slide's a little bit about myself. Uh, in my 40-year career, I've had uh, about half of that's been teaching, and about uh, maybe 10 years has been on uh, basic research, mostly semiconductor research. And my dissertation was in quantum inductance within linear response theory. But all that's kind of dated. It's kind of 1980s uh, stuff. And then the other 10 years of my life has been uh, international efforts, both in export control. And I've had a prior stint at, at EORD uh, from 2007 to 2012. So that's the perspective that I come from. This phrase, uh, prolegomenous catechism, is one from Harold Wooster, who was an early AFOSR program manager that started the information systems in the 1960s. He passed away in uh, 2005, but uh, he funded people like uh, JCR Licklider of ARPANET and uh, Eugene Garfield, who did the science citation, which became part of Google search algorithms and Douglas Engelbart, uh, who invented the computer mouse. Um, so I follow in uh, great footsteps. And um, when I back, went, went back and looked at my papers, I never really noticed the funding people, but I've published papers with AFOSR support. My thesis advisor had ONR support. And if I do like an Erdos thing, uh, I'm only one away from ARO and NASA and others. So that's me. Uh, when I think of quantum, uh, kind of following up on Jim when he thinks of Moore's Law, I usually think of, uh, I'm trying to, at the moment I think I'm trying to do things where we, we almost have countable numbers of atoms or photons. And when I first learned uh, quantum mechanics, the, the particle in the box is the really interesting uh, uh, first problem you think about in quantum mechanics. And you notice that as the box gets smaller, the energy levels get higher. 
And then you simultaneously learn that room temperature is around 1 40th of an EV. And when I first learned it, it was in the 1980s, and these two energies were quite far apart. But today, they're right at the same sort of level, which is, I think, why we live in very interesting times. Um, simultaneously, before I learned quantum mechanics, the Hagelmann effect hadn't even been discovered. And I'll, so I'll try to say a little bit more about grants I have with small numbers of atoms and um, small numbers of photons. And then I'm going to try to tie it into some regional history that actually steps back 70 years, um, about to the 1950s. Jim already put up that, by law, I'm not allowed to think about applications. But of course, as a military funder, I, I actually think about applications and how they're going to tie into applications. And um, so he already had that slide up. So I'll, I'm going to put, uh, I'll just briefly mention two um, uh, grants I have that started with small numbers of atoms and then uh, two more with uh, that are dealing with photons. Um, this is a group, uh, Kovalenko's group at ETH Zurich, which um, in 2015 they started discovering these uh, perovskite uh, quantum dots. And they're very bright, uh, very interesting. The citation over there on the, maybe you can't quite read the numbers, but the he's already on his way to being a highly cited researcher because the 2015 discovery has really uh, opened up the field and a lot of people are now exploring perovskite quantum dots. Coming from a world of uh, molecular beam epitaxy, um, this is quite amazing to see structures here that are uh, that are well ordered and on on the scale of countable numbers of atoms. And if you m if you make these things, you can select on them. Uh, so you have if they're if if they're varied you have quite a bit of tunability in that, and then you can select for ones you want. So at a basic research level, it's promising for some of the applications we might envision for this, uh, for generating photons. Uh, yesterday we he heard from uh, Professor Izzerda on the Monarch uh, foundry with 2D um, van der Waals structures, and we have a grant um, with Kostya Novoselov's group at the National University of Singapore. I, I had a grant in my earlier tour with uh, Kostya and Andre Geim, who later won the Nobel Prize for Graphene. And in, in Kostya's Nobel lecture, he, he pulled out a deck of cards and shuffled them. And, and that's sort of where we're at in trying to build, a, as uh, Professor Izzerda said, trying to build these structures and explore this very large design space. Uh, both these two uh, th both these two grants were funded, co-funded with colleagues from ONRG, and this particular one um, I, I fund with Shigam Batar out of the Tokyo office of ONR, and he he coined a, a, a paradigm that I like to think about, that this is sort of a, a top-down approach to building these very small structures where we're approaching you know countable numbers of atoms, whereas the the prior grant was sort of a, a bottom-up approach where we're using chemistry to assemble these things. And we don't know uh, what's going to win, or maybe they'll both win for their various niches. Uh, I'm going to switch to two uh, grants that involve photons. This one's at the University of Bath. This is the first uh, topological uh, photonic crystal in a fiber. And so this is a, a fiber preform stack. Looks like a uh, about this size of a lo of long spaghetti here, right there, and then the red dots on the ends of those indicate that they've put some different size holes in this thing. So they're they're coiling a one-dimensional uh, sort of chain of coupled uh, cavities in the in the photonic crystal, and then it gets stretched out, kind of like making uh, candy floss or or cotton candy, and here's uh, some of the actual results. So these are actual pictures of the actual uh, end of the fiber, micrographs of the cross section. You can kind of see here's the coil here with a big hole, and then a small hole, and then a big hole, and then a small hole, and there's like 13 sort of, if you want to call them, photonic atoms in here. 
And if you inject light into one end, um, it stays locked in there because of the topology, and it doesn't, uh, this is after it comes out about an optical table away. And if you inject it into, I think this was injected into this, this particular fiber here, and then it spreads out here. There's actually a kind of fun Lego model you can build with that. And it, it reminds me of, um, you know, weakly coupled pendulums, how it, how it can transport or, or stay locked in the topological mode. So there's not a lot of fiber draw towers. This one, at, uh, for research purposes, this one at Bath is one of the first. It's, it created the first uh, photonic uh, crystal in a fiber. And now it's created the first topological photonic crystal in the fiber. And so this is an exciting recent result, just six months old in publication. Uh, switching to, uh, you saw Dr. Roach had a slide on ORCA, and I, I'll have the same slide of the timeline there. Um, we're funding, um, we, we do fund companies, as he mentioned, and uh, this one is uh, uh, quantum memory. It's, uh, ORCA stands for off-resonance cascaded absorption. Uh, I guess it's also an apex predator, if you think about the whale. But, um, so, yeah, so this particular one, it, it, it's a bit like the, the, the connect memory that we saw Dr. Goddard speak about, um, except I think there's, there are some differences. This particular one, I think, has higher fidelity. There's a recent paper I was just reading last night by uh, the Wiseman Group in Israel that talks about a record uh, f uh, fidelities for uh, this latter type of quantum memory. That was a June publication. And um, so I want to follow up on, on, the, f on the photons. Uh, oh, I guess one of the reasons, that one of the grants is, we, one of the goals of this grant is to try to not only make it more efficient, but try to make it smaller and more packageable. So that's kind of like reducing size uh, swap, size, weight, and power. Uh, and of course their goal is to enable uh, quantum computing, photonic quantum computing. Uh, so Dr. Roach showed this. Uh, one of the recent results from ORCA is, is the optics letters. Uh, uh, so that's, even though it's a company, the basic research is be, is, will always be published in the open literature. That's the only product that grants have. We don't have deliverables of quantum memories or anything. Uh, but this, this relationship actually goes back to earlier grants with Ian Walmsley. Um, he showed this slide, and, and there were other super exciting results. This, entangling of microscopic diamonds. That's, that's a, an entangled photon in two different millimeter size uh, microscopic specks of diamond on the optical table. That's 2011. They, they published th the first boson, boson sampling on a photonic chip. The lead author on that was actually uh, an Air Force, uh, an Air Force AFIT sponsored student named Justin Spring. Uh, it, we didn't require them to have an AFIT student, but that's a nice small world intersection. I didn't even know he was doing the, the, uh, that work until we visited the lab, so that was just a really nice coincidence. And, um, but this, this work with, e with Ian actually can go back to um, the, the 50s. And M I picture here M.O. Wolf, and I've got a name George Parent, and this is uh, on, on coherent optics. I guess early. Earlier in the slide, when I had the photons up, I had a, there was a quote from Dirac. Dirac had a quote in his quantum textbook that single photons always inter interfere with themselves. This is in the 1958 fourth edition. And, and uh, two photons will never interfere with each other. And of course, that's not quite right. Um, and at the same time, uh, Wolf was publishing um, uh, his book Born and Wolf, and I, I've heard that the chapter on coherence was something that Wolf had to fight to keep in and that Born wasn't really uh, all that interested in it. And, and we were around then, as Dr. Roach says, uh, FOSR is uh, 71 years old. We were one year younger. We're 70 years old. And um, I think if this will work, I can let Professor Wolf tell the story in his own words here. Because he was interviewed in 1984 for a book by... Um, Joan Bromberg on about lasers, the, the birth of lasers in America from 1950s. So let me see. This is about two minutes. Uh, I put. I have to. Yeah, I have to switch. Pin. Or. Right, that. 
did. Now, here, uh, Mandel had come for a sabbatical year here. Yes. And you were working on uh, these coherent light papers. And yes. Um, do you have any specific memories as to how you decided to work on these particular papers at this point? Those are papers 42. Uh, that's by paper 42 and 43. You give me just a minute to refresh my memory about yes. dates, I think, probably. Th well, there is this uh, problem of some properties of coherent light, right, the paper which we published. That comes under this. Cambridge Research now, Center is you mentioned how uh, you asked the question how it's connected Center. parents' definition of coherence and so on. Uh, let me tell you a bit of a background. You may not know that parent was my student. No, yes. Uh, in fact, this is when I mentioned somebody sent uh, the Air Force Cambridge Research Center sent a parent to work with me, and he did his thesis in Manchester on partial coherence with me. So he's my student. And that's why the Air F you had that Air Force contact? Well, let me tell the story, because it's quite amusing. Right. Okay. I uh, told you that I had problems in getting a university job in England. It was very difficult in those days. And I was, I had at that time a fellowship called ICI Fellowship, Imperial Chemical Industry Writing Fellowship. And it was coming to an end, but it could in principle be extended. I had one extension already, but I still didn't have a job, and there was a question of another extension, and I didn't get it. And that was parent only a few months after he came from the state specifically to work with me on partial coherence. And he realized that his supervisor will be without a job in a few months. He almost panicked, and he phoned somebody at the Air Force Cambridge Research Center. Uh -huh. And they approached me that I would be interested to, um, to work on a contract for them. And they arranged a contract for me through the European office in Brussels. Within a few months, I had support for another year or so, so I was able, you know, mm -hmm. I was able to work in Loma. And then during the year, I had offered to come to Rochester, and he finished the thesis without me. And he did most of the work whilst I was there, but he needed to have a, a strong, a strict residential qualifications in England. He needed six months or so to stay, so he stayed another six months. I, I love that. I mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right down to, you know, visa delays and worried about. Uh, residency requirements. Um, and of course, uh, Ian Walmsley, who, who was a co-founder of ORCA, he was at, at Rochester in the 1980s and 90s, and um, th that's his picture over there. And in the 1950s, um, there was a, there's tributes to Emma Wolf, and you can download this from uh, the DTIC site here, and this is them going over to Brussels uh, for the World's Fair there, and there was, that's when the atomium, uh, the atomium structure was built, and there was outreach programs, you see some diffraction patterns here and stuff, and our office was in Brussels till 1970, so they probably visited the people that funded them there, in fact the history of our office is in Brussels talk about the large increase in uh, visitors to the Brussels office during the World's Fair year. I think some 200 people visited in that year. And, and even, um, even though the timeline uh, that I showed for EORD's recent engagement with uh, Ian Walmsley and Orca was 10 years, you know, Ian was doing his dissertation with uh, Michael Raymer, who was also mentioned at this conference, and this was in the 1980s. And this was uh, sponsored under the Joint Services Optical Program. So I think, I think we're we're always in it for the long haul, and these things do take quite a bit of time. And um, this is a bit of an eye chart, but this is I want to talk about timescales a little bit. Uh, there was a question about uh, AFOS, AFOSR's funding. It, it's been relatively stable over the years. This is from 1945 to 2025, 2020, present day. And this is the green line, which is AFOSR, except it's magnified by 10, because the money scale is the green mountain of all the rest of RDT and E. So basic research is, is, is such a tiny amount of the RDT and E budget. These are all in constant dollars. And then these, uh, these uh, rectangles, these are the number of papers that AFOSR is sponsored per year. And the reason I did this is I wanted to try to figure out, because I came from a semiconductor world, how much investment did it take to, to make gallium arsenide and gallium nitride systems? And so I did a search on uh, a lot of Google Scholar searching, and this is the percentage of papers that have uh, gallium arsenide in it. And then in blue, gallium nitride. And it all makes sense 
Gallium nitride really kicked off in the early 90s. And, um, but it built on the back of gallium arsenide, and those, those, take, those took decades. And some 18,000 AFOSR-sponsored papers. So to tell the story in a book with all the people's names and stuff would be extremely difficult. Um, here, here's where we are with entangled photons. It started ramping up in 2000. And there was a joke in the lab when I worked in um, compound semiconductors that their time is 20 years off and, and always will be. Um, but that wasn't true. Um, here's some early, early AFO, AFONR gallium nitride wafers. And here's a box for my gallium nitride wall charger, which I brought in my hand here. It's got very nice size, weight, and power, and cost as well. I've got like five of these because I'm a sucker for um, get, whoops, I'm a sucker for uh, gallium nitride in, in marketing. Um, but gallium nitride isn't just in USB chargers. Here's a um, here's here's all the military systems it's it's now in. Um, this is just from the Raytheon website. So I, I don't know if, if I think was it Mark Linderman that said uh, we're 10 years into the 20 years off. Uh, I hope so, but I'm not quite sure. I think in terms of uh, Levita mentioned in her talk hype and progress. I, th I certainly think there's a lot of progress, but uh, hype and predicting time scales. I, I think I like uh, Professor Dresselhoff's comment. Uh, it builds up false expectations. There's, there's no time scales. Um, we just have to figure out what basic research will allow and keep at it. So, People mentioned the sun never sets on AFOSR. I had to brief uh, an AFRL commander once, and I was told, don't put anything on your slides that you're not sure is true. So I checked the, the day-night terminator, and at the time, we didn't have the Melbourne office, so I had to change it to almost never sets. But uh, the Sao Paulo office didn't help relieve that uh, winter solstice problem. But now the Melbourne office has, we can truly say, the sun never sets on AFOSR. Welcome back. Uh, we'll get started with our next talk now that we've heard from AFOSR. We'll, we'll dig a little deeper into some of the technical talks on funded efforts. So one of the efforts is the dynamics of qubits coupled to thermal bath from Dr. Antonio Vidalia Barranco. Turn the page here. Uh, he's joining us from the University of Campinas uh, in Brazil. Dr. Vidal Barranco is a topical editor of the Journal of the Optical Society of America B and has contributed significantly to the understanding of quantum systems. Antonio. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, I am glad to be here and I thank you very much for the invitation, especially Jim Like who invited me to come over here and I well I come from Brazil, which is a long way, I mean more than uh, well, almost a, a eight thousand kilometers from, from here. Uh it took me a long time to get here because of the weather conditions in uh, New Jersey where uh, my plane was, was landing. Um, so, uh, but in <laughs> some sense, um, Brazil and the uh, USA are not that far away because you see the, the northern part of Brazil, it's uh, uh, significant, significantly closer to southern part of the USA, so as you see in this cartoon. Anyway, uh, just uh, a couple of words about the uh, University of Campinas in which uh, I work, where I work. So we have about uh, um, 
1,700 faculty, and in 2013 uh, we were uh, 28th uh, young university. Uh, uh, it's a ranking of uh, young uh, universities uh, le less than 50 years old. Yeah, so were placed in the 28th place uh, at that time. And the Institute of Physics, we work in, uh, uh, in several areas in physics, yeah, from um, um, high energy physics, uh, cosmology, solid state, uh, optics. And so we have 78 faculty working on several areas. Well, it's a, a brief outline of my talk. Um, so, talking about uh, open quantum systems, and also uh, some issues uh, uh, related to the uh, equations describing the evolution of uh, coupled systems. So, um, the quantum system is uh, inevitably coupled to its environment. And so I'm, I, I'm going to call the uh, um, state of a quantum system as uh, rho s, as a density operator associated to it. And How, how do you w do we model the uh, influence of uh, such an environment? We have to include the environment uh, in the, the quantum description. So um, we uh, describe the quantum systems uh, by um, uh, Hamiltonians, yeah, Hamiltonian operator represent a uh, quantum system and we have this uh, von Neumann equation, which is uh, basically the Schrodinger equation. So we have this uh, uh, Hamiltonian for the uh, environment, yeah, HE, and HS for the system and, and the interaction, uh, Hamiltonian between the uh, environment and the system. Uh, the Evolution of the environment is uh, ignored, uh, so we trace over the environment variables. And then we are left with uh, rho s, which is the uh, uh, density operator relative to the system. Um, if you include a second system, so you one and two, uh, and, and they m can be interacting, so there is a, a portion of uh, the Hamiltonian now which includes the H um, I S C, S sorry, H I one two interaction between the systems, and also the, the environment, as you can see. Well, uh, this uh, standard approach to tackle uh, these problems, yeah, it's. Uh, we built uh, uh, master equations, which, I which are equations for the systems, that's the operator. And they, they have a unitary part, which is the, the first term, second uh, and in the right-hand side, and also a non-unitary part, yeah, which represents the action of the environment. So what, wh why this is important, yeah? Well, the quantum technologies uh, normally involve a uh, couple of quantum systems which are subjected to interacting with environments, yeah? Uh, well, there is an issue here because for a given uh, interaction between the system and the environment, yeah, the, uh, 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 HI, SE, yeah? So you don't have a, a unique master equation, so you can have master equation which includes 
um, uh, the, the interaction or, uh, of the systems in the non-unitary part and equations which uh, uh, do not include such interaction. Yeah? So they're called um, um, global or, or microscopic master equation and local or phenomenological master equation. Uh, in the 70s, yeah, th th this was uh, pointed out by uh, Walls in the paper, in which uh, he discusses the these uh, uh, different master equations, and then uh, uh, Walls and Car Carmichael had a paper about the how to uh, uh, about a general method of uh, building uh, master equations of coupled systems, yeah. Well, this is work of myself and my student in which we compare these uh, two uh, evolutions uh, using different master equations for a, a, a system of coupled qubits. Yeah? Well, uh, this is a, a very basic thing because we like qubits, which uh, we, we like preparing qu uh, these systems. Uh, uh, in superposition states, yeah, and if you if you have a couple qubits, so it naturally arises entanglement between them. Uh, this is not coming out okay. Yeah, my equations they are messed up. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so our model uh, uh, is basically uh, a model of uh, two couple qubits, uh, and we did not make the rotating wave approximation, so we could. For for the the qubits, yeah. So we could uh, uh, use uh, different uh, uh, coupling uh, regimes, yeah, strong coupling or weak coupling. Yeah, we have the, the this model uh, for the environment, and here are the master equations. Uh, we can write uh, a, lo a local master equation, which is the usually usual. Uh, uh, master equation which uh, uh, widespread in the literature and uh, we wrote this uh, global master equation in which the jump operators they uh, are based on the dress state so they include interaction uh, of the between the qubits in the non unitary part So first thing to note is that the uh, the local approach uh, does not uh, lead to a thermal equilibrium state uh, for a steady state of the system, while the, the global approach uh, leads to a thermal equilibrium state for steady state, yeah? So if we consider the, the weak coupling regime, so we can have a, I mean, s establish a comparison between the uh, entanglement uh, in each in each uh, model, and you see that there are some differences. Yeah, if you see the the uh, blue curve corresponds to the, uh, the bath at zero temperature. And you increase the temperature of the bath, so the uh, red curve corresponds to a higher temperature, and you see that uh, the uh, entanglement, which is a periodic function of time in this case, you have two couple qubits, if uh, the there is no uh, coupling to the an environment, uh, but then you lose entanglement if you uh, uh, have a higher temperature environment, you, you lose it faster, yeah? So still then you have in the um, uh, yeah each one corresponds to one model so uh, you can see that the uh, there there's no difference in the uh, curves when it the t is equal to equal zero while the 
if you increase the temperature, you start having a difference. Even in the weak coupling regime, where uh, it's, it's you're supposed to have uh, the local approach uh, valid because uh, I mean you 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 are uh, uh, well the thing is that you, you neglect the the uh, interaction between the qubits, um, assuming the uh, weak coupling between them. So uh, this is what people do normally, but. Uh <laughs> If you have a global approach in which you take into account this such interaction, um, the even the weak coupling regime you, you have some differences. Yeah. Uh, we can also make a, a kind of a composite bath. So you look at, at one qubit, qubit one evolution, and include qubit two in the in the bath. Yeah. So you trace over the uh, variables of qubit, qubit two. Now you can cal calculate the evolution of the entropy of uh, qubit one, and actually <laughs> we see contradictory results in this case. Uh, the, the evolutions co coincide uh, with uh, uh, t, t equals to zero bath, yeah, the zero temperature bath. But uh, if you rise the temperature of the bath, so you see that the, the, the graph and the, the right plots, they, they are um, the, uh, the, the from the, the local model. And you see that uh, there is a slower uh, loss of entropy. So the, 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 s the s state of the qubit one it uh, becomes becomes uh, mixed more slowly than uh, in I if the temperature is is, is uh, less. Yeah. So <laughs> you increase the temperature, and your uh, qubit one gets uh, to a mixed state. Mixed state. Uh, it takes more slowly. So, which is uh, counterintuitive, while in the left plot, which is the, the global model, you have a, a loss of coherence. Uh, re it's it's really fast for a uh, higher temperature. Yeah, so you see this uh, in this simple example. You have uh, completely contradictory results. So this this is our work uh, from our group. It was analyzed the a different scenario. Uh, two uh, uncoupled qubits, which are coupled to a third qubit, qubit B, which is itself coupled to a thermal bath. Yeah, uh, but here it, it's it was used the local approach. Yeah. So in this model, uh, here we have the entanglement between uh, the uh, A1 and A2 qubits. And the entanglement, ent entanglement between these two qubits survives for longer, for a higher temperature bath, which is also counterintuitive. And well, we, we, we didn't analyze this model in the global approach. But um, uh, you see that the this is very critical because if you want to uh, um, avoid or uh, mitigate or control a quantum system which is inevitably interacting with some sort of environment, so <laughs> we need to know what's going on there, and we have to start from the right equation. Um, which is the right equation for coupled quantum systems? Yeah, that's uh, the question we are posing. Well, to conclude, so we um, uh, for a given uh, system environment interaction of uh, Hamiltonian, we can have different master equations 
actually uh, there are some other models I mean uh, this is I just picked up a, a way of building a, a particular global master equation but you can actually have uh, other ways of doing that and other equations yeah because normally we have uh, several approximations are made of course it's a perturbative approach and it's uh, to keep track of on that and to see the suitability for uh, a given uh, some given conditions is not an easy way uh, it's not easy to do it so oh yeah so I'm just highlighting that uh, the steady state is something is an issue because uh, in certain models you cannot uh, you just don't have the, the uh, thermalization with uh, of your system with the bath yeah and divergences they may occur in the even the weak coupling regime which is I mean it's a red light yeah you just uh, say well we are you're uh, using equations in, uh, which uh, we believed they would work in a weak coupling regime but is this true so we have also counterintuitive effects but are, are they real these counterintuitive effects or not so uh, uh, in my view uh, uh, it is required uh, more reflection about this kind of systems so just a quick, quick word about uh, our work in our quantum optics group so we have some um, work uh, on microtroidal cavities yeah which is uh, this uh, um, toroidally shaped cavities which you you is a fiber basically and you you uh, can uh, manipulate light the quantum level in such systems so uh, also uh, generation of uh, uh, quantum states of light using uh, a quantum scissors devices or I mean, actually, uh, we, we, we modify a state which can be a classical state, such a coherent state, and uh, create a subposonium light and, and um, squeeze light anyway. Uh, well, these optomechanical systems that uh, we have this uh, mirror coupled to a quantum, quantum light. And also, uh, I have interest in. in um, um, continuous variable uh, quantum key distribution which uh, 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 in opposition to uh, the protocols using single photon sor sources we uh, have uh, interest in proposals using coherent states or uh, is lightly modified coherent states which are um, could be better integrated in the existing uh, communication systems yeah so <laughs> we have uh, an issue here because if you have a, a quantum cryptography based on single photon so sources yeah you need a dedicated line and special detectors and it's very uh, difficult to integrate this into uh, the existing uh, communication systems but I, uh, on the other hand if you have um, coherent light which uh, I mean you, it doesn't need to be a single photon source or uh, it doesn't need to be that weak uh, um, a low energy uh, signals yeah so you can uh, use these uh, intensity detectors which are very cheap and uh, uh, anyway so this is uh, thanks for your attention then So I was wondering, were the counterintuitive results only associated with the EVA master equation that didn't include the thermal uh, bath? The, sorry, could you repeat it because it's... I don't even know if this is working. Is, is this working? 
Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I was saying, were the counterintuitive results only associated with the master equation that didn't include the thermal bath? And was it counterintuitive because you had a weakly coupled bath, and so you would assume that uh, the master equation that included the uh, bath and the one that didn't would be closely the same if it was weakly coupled, but it was counterintuitive because you saw that it, it actually made a big difference which one you used? Is that what, what your, was that the real conclusion you drew? Uh, yeah, it, it looks like, I mean, the local approach, I, it leads to counterintuitive effects. But in, in my view, I mean, you, you're not including the, the, the uh, interaction between the, the, the subsystems in the non-unitary part. So uh, maybe uh, this is not correct. I mean, the, the, the counterintuitive effects are, are really not there because you, your description is not uh, suitable from the beginning, yeah? So that's... So it, it's because you're not including the uh, the environment when, and that's no, why the counterintuitive uh, results occur? No, no, I, I including the environment. I, I wha What happens in the local approach is that you're not including the in, uh, interaction between the subsystems, yeah? yeah? The qubits, in this case, in the non-unitary part. Okay. So the environment is there in both approaches, yeah? But uh, in one approach, you don't have the uh, terms related to the interaction between the subs subsystems in the non-unitary part, while in the other approach, you have okay. these terms, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. So, thank you. I, I find the thermodynamics of these entangled systems really interesting. My question is on your conclusion number four, you said that this state was longer, but longer compared to what? Compared to the lower temperature states or to the states without interactions? There we go. Uh, four uh, four. Yeah, yeah, as, as the about the example. So, yes, e you see that the, the blue curve corresponds to a lower temperature bath. So the entanglement goes just down quicker than in the case of a higher temperature bath, which is the, the, the red curve. Hi. Uh, it's working? Yes? Okay. Uh, I have a question about uh, common assumption. S speak up, please. Um, I have a question that is a common assumption when we treat uh, open quantum systems. That is the, the initial, the state of the environment is constant. They do not change in time. It's yes. uh, quite common. But uh, the interaction between the system and the environment uh, makes it entangled with the environment. So the entropy of the system it will be equal to the entropy of the environment. And uh, do you know if it's possible to solve this, in my view, a problem? Because if there is a change in the entropy of the system and consequently in the environment entropy, because th uh, the global state is a pure state, and uh, how it's possible to, to, to have this uh, property, to keep constant with change the entropy? Do you think that's possible to solve this approach with this approach? Well, you, you're talking about the nonlinear. Uh, in fact, it's just uh, uh, it's not completely related with your uh, uh, work. I just want to know if your approach could be take this in, in, in count. Well, we, we th this is the uh, Markovian both both equations are, are, are Markovian equations and the, the with the Born approximation. So it's I, I don't know if I, I okay. We can question. discuss about this soon. That's okay. Uh, is, is this? Yeah. No, my asking? point is that the, the the dynamics of the the environment do not exist in general with many assumptions. But uh, if the it's changing the entropy of the environment, I don't understand how it's possible. Uh, in the literature, I mean, but uh, I would like to know if your approach could take in account that yeah, is well i no, I haven't looked into the, the environment, so okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.
So continuing our exploration of AFOSR funded projects, we're privileged to have Dr. Philippe Fernandez Fancini from Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. Dr. Fancini's research in quantum machine learning and protecting quantum information has opened new avenues for applying classical and quantum ML techniques in the study of quantum systems. Welcome, Dr. Fancini. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to stay here today to give my talk. Um, uh, I intend to talk today about an algorithm that uh, we developed in our university. I have been working with each, a group of the computer scientists and the, my idea here is to present a, a research project that uh, we will develop in during these next years. So the uh, the classical algorithm is called just a second. Now it's working. Okay, great. So uh, the the algorithm is the optimum pass for us, and the the idea that we intend to do in this research project project is to develop a quantum version of this algorithm. Uh, I will briefly speak about the OPF, that's an uh, algorithm for machine learning. Uh, oh, yeah. And the optimum pass for us is a graph-based framework to machine learning. It can be used for image processing, computer vision, optimization, remote session, and many other tasks. Uh, it's this is why we are focusing on this kind of algorithm because it can also be used for supervised classification, unsupervised clustering. So we have uh, many opportunities to use this uh, algorithm. Uh, I will just give a brief introduction about the idea, and the I will use an example as the OPF for classification. Here is to uh, supervise the classification just to, to give the idea uh, how it works. Oh, again. Okay, uh, here's the, the basic idea. It's a, as our idea of the optimum pass forest. It's a graph based uh, algorithm. Then the idea is that uh, in this case of uh, classification, supervised classification, uh, we have a complete graph and the we begin just uh, take a complete connection and calculate the distance between them. It's a weighted graph. Uh, the first step of the algorithm is... Uh, oh. Okay. Uh, it uses a minimum spanning tree uh, to calculate the minimum uh, connection between these, uh, these uh, vertices. Uh, this is an important aspect for the algorithm and the, the, the point is that we intend to use a quantum algorithm also to, to try to develop this, uh, this part of the algorithm. So the idea is that we implement this minimum spanning tree and once we determine it, we uh, select some prototypes, these uh, uh, vertices that connect two different classes. So once you determine your prototypes, that's in this case A and D, now we begin an initialization that uh, this vertices begins to concur other vertices in this cluster. The idea is that uh, we just begin taking the some costs for each vertices. So we begin with uh, zero costs for the uh, prototypes. And we include the infinite costs for the other, uh, the rest of the, the vertices. And then the, we begin our process of the conquer to determine the uh, cost of the each vertices. So the idea here is that each vertice uh, uh, offer for the the other one uh, the, the the maximum. The it's uh, the distance between these uh, these uh, edges or the, the value that they have uh, in this one. So in this case, for example, you see that A offers 0.3 for B, 
and then if it's infinite we just change the cost of b when we try to connect a with c we have 0 0.5 but the, the max the minimum here is 0 0.4 as uh, 0 0.4 because there is this way that we can take and the f max here it means the maximum value of the edge is 0 0.4 then they take 0 0.4 for each case. So the idea is to develop this for all uh, vertices in the graphs, since in the end we have uh, uh, the optimal pass forest uh, um, classification. Uh, each vertices has um, now a cost, and now with a new data, I can try to uh, classify. So if you introduce a new data in this approach, we will need to calculate the distance and the also the cost. And depends of the distance and the costs, uh, one, cla um, one class can in some way conquer and classify uh, a new uh, edge, a new vertices. This is the basic idea. I will not take the details of this algorithm, but I it's, as I said, it can be used for uh, a large number of uh, tasks. Okay, as I said, the, the one part of this algorithm is the minimum uh, spanning tree. That's a structure that connects all nodes of a weight graph with the minimum total weight uh, without forming cycles. And the, what we intend to do is in some way uh, to determine, uh, to develop an uh, algorithm that can be hybrid or full quantum. So the idea is to firstly to use uh, the quantum computer to calculate uh, the minimum three, uh, uh, and the if possible, we intend to develop uh, the full version of the OPF using not our not just the minimum spanning tree to calculate by means of a quantum computer, but also we intend to develop a full strategy. Uh, to calculate also the conquer part of the, the algorithm. Uh, it's, uh, the idea is that it, it could be faster and it also mm, probably we can have better performance if we compare with the classical uh, algorithm. This is why we intend to develop our, um, our algorithm. And the how we will do this? What's the strategy that we will use to develop this uh, quantum algorithm. So the idea is to use um, uh, variational quantum algorithms. So uh, using this kind of algorithm that it was maybe in the f last five years, it's a, it's a quite common algorithm to develop a quantum machine learning we intend to, to create a version of the UPF uh, using this, uh, this kind of algorithm. So, uh, uh, let's see a little bit about uh, uh, variational algorithms. So, just to, to mention the power of these algorithms, the variational algorithms, I will just talk a little bit about a recent work that we developed in our team in the physics department, where we use variational algorithms to calculate, uh, to calibrate uh, an, uh, a question-answer system. Here, I just mentioned this part because I would like to talk about the importance of the variational algorithms. It's not related with the OPF, not of the quantum OPF, but I just want to mention the strategy that we intend to use and how powerful is this strategy to develop uh, quantum algorithms based in variational algorithms. So in this paper that it was developed with the group of the entity data, it's a TI company, <coughs> we use a variational algorithm to calibrate question answer system. The idea is to try in some way to calibrate the Roberta, that's a robustly optimized BERT pre-trained approach. It's a quite famous uh, language model, a uh, pre-trained algorithm uh, developed by Facebook. And the when we mean calibration, is that sometimes you get some answer, 
that is not uh, with a correct probability with the, the, the answer. So we need to adjust these probabilities. That is the answer of the algorithm. It's quite important because, for example, for autonomous vehicles, uh, it's not a good idea to have uh, um, a bad suggestion. Yes, yeah? so it's important to to take care when you give the probability of success considering a uh, machine learning algorithm. So um, here's the idea of the, the, the algorithm. This is the, the basic steps for training a classical machine learning. You have your data, you have a model that you introduce, a cost function that you use to determine how near of the answer you are, then you compute some gradients to actualize, to update your variables, and then it continues until you find a minimum cost function. This is a basic idea when you talk about machine learning. And the point when we talk in, uh, with the parameterized circuits, uh, we change this model for a quantum version. This is what we did. So the point is that we take this classical data, we encode this classical data in a quant state, apply a parameterized algorithm, this is the encoding data, the parameterized algorithm, and we measure the qubits to have a feedback. With this feedback, we just uh, actualize our uh, parameters and then we continue exactly as in this model, but now using for uh, this part of the algorithm a uh, quantum version. Uh, just to show the power of these algorithms in some tasks, uh, here is the, the uh, calibration question answer system that we use to calibrate with a quantum algorithm. This is the uncalibrated version, expectation uh, error. This is the, the confidence, expected confidence, and the, as you see, we use internal NNTT data to do this, but as you can see, uh, this is not well calibrated. There's many mistakes, because here they said, for example, that the probability to be right is like 100%, and in fact, it's almost 30%. So it's an uncalibrated uh, model. The idea is to use some variables of the, the, the some features of the algorithm to calibrate uh, this algorithm to get a better uh, answer concerning what is in fact true about the accuracy. And what we can see is that if you use a quantum version, in fact, you can get better results than classical algorithms. Here we use extreme gradient boosting algorithm. You see that the expectation confidence error is 0 0.15 and we reach 0.14 using a full quantum version. Here's the features that you use to calibrate, and uh, here's the result without calibration. You see that it's possible to calibrate and to have uh, a better result when compared with the, 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 the usual one. So the, oh. so the point, as I said, is to use this strategy, these uh, variational algorithms, to develop our quantum OPF, uh, also the hybrid one and the, the full version of the, the, the algorithm. This is what we intend to do. Okay, so just to, to point the what we expect to when we compare the classical OPF with the quantum OPF, we believe that the results that can be achieved with the development of the key OPF have uh, significant implications and can have potential for several fields. It can improve the efficiency. So if you compare the OPF classical one with the quantum one, we intend to have uh, higher efficiency. Uh, of course, that nowadays classical OPF already have um, impact for classical machine learning. And uh, we intend to see how quantum OPF can impact the real-world applications, and uh, as it can be used for optimization and many other tasks, it can be applications in the military, commercial, and academic research, and in many other uh, areas.
and of course that you bring advancement on quantum computing. Uh, it will be able to contribute to the advancement of quantum computer techniques and their applications in the optimization and machine learning. Okay, uh, our dream with this is when it is done, it's a, as I said, it's a research project, uh, is to compare this algorithm with other well-known algorithms in the literature. Uh, Qawa is a well-known uh, algorithm to optimization, also Falcon, and in we intend with, to with this to develop uh, our uh, uh, algorithm, the key OPF, and compare with these other two. This two has some limitations, of course, of course, that uh, we intend to have some limitations to QOPF, and the idea is to develop this algorithm to try to understand uh, how we can make it better, use um, QOPF instead of Qual or Falcon for optimization. This is what we intend to do in the end. <coughs> Just to talk a little bit about our team, uh, uh, there is two departments that uh, you have working together. There is a computer science department, that's a group that developed the OPF. And so, Jean Paulo Papa, that's my colleague, he developed the, the Optimum Pass first in 2012. And uh, as I said, it was being used for uh, many, many tasks uh, during these 10 years. Uh, in my case, I am from the physics department. I worked with uh, quantum computing, open quantum systems for more than 20 years and uh, since uh, 2017 I just began to use machine learning to solve uh, physical problems, mainly concerning quantum phase transition, quantum thermodynamics and also uh, non-Markovian processing considered open quantum system. So uh, recently we also have some results using quantum machine learning, uh, this, pa this, uh, this, this work that I present here, and the other two papers, one published now in 2023, and uh, we have other two papers uh, to appear in quantum machine intelligence, uh, mainly also focusing on the uh, treatment of uh, physical problems. So to conclude, um, uh, the research finds and advancements in QoPath, as I said, have the potential to be transferred uh, to a wide range of user and domains. It can be used for military users because of the optimization capabilities and the cybersecurity and defense because it can uh, uh, improve uh, cybersecurity uh, secure communications, encryption protocols, and they also to autonomous operations, since optimization is the core of many of these tasks. So that's all I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity. Hi, Larry Merkel from Air Force Institute of Technology. Hi. Uh, I think I'm missing something big. Um, there are well-known efficient algorithms for finding minimum spanning trees. Yes. So I'm not clear on why you decided to start by replacing that okay. part. Uh, it's, uh, it's in fact, you're right. It's not any period problem, but he already exists some algorithms that is faster than the classical ones. And uh, when you treat a huge amount of uh, data, uh, then it could be bring some uh, new uh, opportunities. This is the main point. But nowadays already exists some, of course, it's polynomial one, but there is some algorithms that are faster than the classical ones. So the first step should be to try to introduce it. And when we talk about the full version, we intend to see if we can have uh, better uh, performance in with the with this also it's important to to ex uh, to to mention that the prototypes we use here mst but we can also try to use other strategies also to determine these prototypes and uh, we don't know what's the best strategy to determine this prototype so maybe we can tr also to try to introduce other kinds of uh, um, strategies to determine and uh, we would like to test this Okay. Um, th 
thank you for the great talk. Um, my question is more technical, and I'm thinking about a applications. And if I'm not mistaken, BERT has 256 dimensions. I'm sorry, could you repeat? BERT, BERT, all those embeddings have 256 dimensions, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how is this implementable in a quantum system? No, no, the point is that we just used to calibrate the BERT. So yeah. uh, when you, you uh, evaluate BERT, yeah. it gives you some features in the end. Mm -hmm. And that's I mentioned here. And then yes, you yeah. use these five features to calibrate the answer of the BERT. So just five features that we use to calibrate. So we just use five qubits in this case to calibrate the answer of the BERT. Not the, the f the, uh, we don't use to, to develop a BERT, but just to calibrate it. Great. I, I was a little bit lost in that detail. Do you mind going back to a, sl to a slide or two? I'm sorry? I was a little bit lost in that detail. Do you mind going back to like a slide or two to... Describe that? Um, uh, or we can talk afterward. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so can everyone hear me now? So uh, we're going to call an audible here. We had several requests uh, based on travel schedules for this afternoon to move up uh, Dr. Genevine's talk. So we're going to do that and then go into lunch and then lab tours following. So everything's going to, we're still going to have everything other than uh, moving this talk up. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Genevine with us. He's an associate professor in physics and astronomy at the University of Waterloo and faculty member at the Institute for Quantum Computing. Dr. Genevine's expertise and dedication have positioned him as a leading figure in the realm of quantum communications. As the initiator and scientific lead for the KeySat space mission, he has been instrumental in advancing the frontiers of quantum technology. His research focuses on implementing quantum communications with a particular emphasis on establishing robust connections between ground and space. And we are very much closely collaborating with him on a new uh, project that we have um, with Canada on this. Oh, I'm going to go back here for him. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, he's been highly recognized with several awards. For example, his approach for generating photon triplets was acknowledged by Physics World as one of the top 10 breakthroughs in 2017. He was also honored with the Wilhelm Exner Medal f in by the Australian, Austrian Trade Association in 2018. This esteemed award recognizes individuals who have made exceptional advancements in their respective fields, and Dr. Genevine's achievements in quantum communications have left a lasting impact. We're very fortunate to have him here with us today, and with that, please welcome Professor Genevine. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Um, and and uh, I appreciate that uh, now I'm between uh, what, what's holding us up for the lunch and, and also the... Uh yeah, okay, I'll just hold it. Um, there's some balancing issues here. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and I'd like to give you a bit of overview of, of our uh, big project on quantum communication in space that we're um, building up in Canada, and I would also, yeah, it's working, and also give you a, a few other perspectives on long-term vision, what's next, what's beyond that for, for large-scale, uh, if not global, quantum communication. Um, just really quick, I'm at, um, it's actually not far from here, just a five or six hour drive. Uh, in Waterloo, where we have the so-called Waterloo Quantum Valley, um, which, which uh, houses several different institutions and, and facilities, uh, all geared to 
uh, c researching quantum information. Ba uh, it goes all the way from basic science, such as the Perimeter Institute, but also at our IQC Institute at the University of Waterloo, up to uh, dedicated VC investors who are looking to, to commercialize this technology. Um, in my lab, uh, as, as was so nicely introduced, uh, I've been working on actually quite a wide spectrum of the of the uh, TRL level, so to say, uh, starting from very basic research on quantum entanglement, photon triplets, new protocols as well, and then quantum channels, uh, where we look at you know how do we how do we do communication in fiber and free space. Uh, we've done several end-to-end -end demonstrations for quantum communication in free space. Um, in particular uh, with aircraft, but also moving vehicles. And, and finally, um, uh, we're involved in, in several quantum, uh, quantum communication related missions. The biggest one being KeySat, which I'll talk more about later, but we've been fortunate to be involved in, in several other projects where we provided flight hardware, so including with uh, partners here in the US. Um, and I'm more than happy to say more about that uh, separately. So, so now going back to the, the research motivation, uh, which is the quantum internet, it was actually re uh, already nicely presented uh, uh, in the last few days in several very impressive um, talks. So the, the ultimate goal of a quantum internet is of course um, networking quantum computers and performing distributed quantum computing. Um, while this is a, a, a grand research challenge, uh, which for sure requires entanglement distribution and, and entanglement routing. Um, it's also very difficult. And so um, today uh, we're still working on more like at the single photon level of schemes, although entanglement distribution has also been investigated. And one of the applications I will mention, even though I know in these halls QKD was not brought up very often, I, but I will mention it as one of the, the use cases we're going to look at. Um, so um, another use case for a quantum internet is actually quite interesting, uh, which is um, uh, quantum enhanced telescopes. So it's a it's a metrology application, if you will, uh, and and we all became aware of this, uh, you know, by now very famous pictures of black holes uh, that were generated by by um, uh, radio astronomers, which used uh, receivers around the Earth uh, in in this. Um, Event Horizon Telescope um, scheme, uh, a large collaboration, and and we're able to by by correlating, co coherently correlating the the the, uh, the data that is recorded at those at those microwave receivers, they were able to get um, very impressive uh, images such as a black hole, and um, in in the optical domain, this is still uh, heavily researched, and current optical interferometric interferometric telescopes can cover a few hundred meters of distances and so what we discovered uh, and um, together with colleagues Daniel Gottesman and Sarah Kroak um, who at the time were both at the Perimeter Institute was a, a, a very interesting protocol uh, for sort of say small-scale quantum networks that is that uh, interestingly quantum entanglement or quantum repeaters even might be able to um, assist these large baseline interferometry and um, so the basic idea is that a photon that, that enters the two telescope will uh, uh, be in a su superposition between, let's say, um, one telescope on the left and another receiver on the right. And now rather than bringing those, those two beams together in vacuum tubes or other methods uh, for interference, uh, we showed that it's, it's, it's uh, equivalent in terms of sensitivity and outcome to actually uh, distribute an entangled photon or an entangled system between uh, uh, the left and the right receiver and perform a two-photon measurement, meaning one photon on the left receiver, one on the right. Overall, this is like a, a, a two-photon interferometer, but interestingly shows exactly the same scaling in terms of sensitivity and output as the, the main protocol. So that's a very interesting application, which um, I also have to admit myself has, ha has not gotten much attention from my own lab, but, but now um, recently, uh, just last week, actually, at a at the Quantum 2.0 conference in Denver, uh, I was really amazed to to see this one-day workshop with with uh, you know well over a hundred participants just joining in in all kind of activities uh, 
and present a lot of interesting presentations on work on, on this quantum telescopy um, uh, protocol. So it's very exciting and could well be one of the few near-term use cases of a, of a quantum entanglement network uh, that's uh, doable on and, and will show a benefit even for shorter distances and shorter um, and, and, and lower performances. Quantum key distribution is, uh, like I said earlier, um, another uh, important application or use case that can be studied. Uh, was developed in 1984 by, by uh, these two fellows here, Charles Bennett and Gilles Brassard. And uh, the, the basic idea is well, photons, which can be s uh, put into a superposition, travel from Alice to Bob, and uh, it, it is secure because if, uh, similar to the Schrodinger cat, right, if the superposition is measured, so if the, this, this box of the with the cat is opened, uh, it will destroy the superposition, and, and this can be detected by Alice and Bob. So that's where the security comes from. And uh, indeed, uh, where, where QQD could help is maybe that, um, you know, as quantum computers are developing, and here's a study from my colleagues Michael, uh, Michele Mosca and, and others at, um, at our Waterloo Institute, uh, from a survey of when will quantum computers be able to, let's say, um, uh, have a you know have an impact on on classical encryption and you know pro quantum computers are advancing so maybe in 15 to 20 years this might be an issue and quant and QKD could could actually be uh, relevant so um, now uh, th that's all I wanted to really say of motivating QKD I think QKD is interesting it's essentially one of the first quantum communication applications that has been you know De developed and, and demonstrated. So here's a picture of um, what I believe is the first experiment for a, com a QKD transmission or a quantum communication experiment, uh, which actually involved the same uh, uh, people, uh, Charles, P Charles Bennett and Gilles Brassard, and they sent uh, essentially single photons over 30 centimeter. This was uh, done in the late um, late 80s. And by now, this has advanced quite a lot. Uh, here's a picture from, um, uh, actually, from our Chinese colleagues, uh, a, a nature a review paper in Nature in, in 2021, where they essentially have a, l a vast network of quantum links for QKD in ground and and also in space, and spanning hundreds of nodes and and thousands of kilometers. So it's it's advanced quite a lot. Um, space quantum technology has has advanced. I should say space quantum communication has advanced a lot and, and uh, again foremost uh, we have our Chinese colleagues with their Mitsio satellite that has uh, shown several major uh, breakthroughs and achievements such as entanglement distribution over 1200 kilometers or but also intercontinental quantum key distribution demonstrations and as many other uh, uh, activities they or, or papers uh, one can read up. Um, there's been other activities, in particular from Japan and Singapore, for demonstrating uh, space uh, quantum technology. And now, nowadays, actually, it's it's amazing. There's just a huge amount of missions and for quantum communication in space, uh, in preparations all over the world. It's uh, it's almost uh, actually mind blowing for somebody who's been in this in this topic for you know 20 years, uh, myself or more than 20 years. Uh, it's amazing now to see how much. Um, how much is happening? So, so why satellites? One might ask. Well, the problem with ground-based links is uh, the, uh, the 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 scaling of losses. So, if I, you know, if I want to cover large distances across a country or a continent or even intercontinental, that a ground-based link uh, will always scale um, in some form exponentially with the the distances. I mean, so what I mean is the the losses of of sending photons across such a channel, uh, while in a in a free space link with a satellite, uh, because it's in vacuum, the the losses uh, scale, uh, well, simply speaking, uh, quadratic with the distance. So that that's a huge differentiator, because um, in space one can easily see that you know thousands, if not millions, of kilometers are conceivable, even with today's uh, telescope technology, for example. So that's I think a, a major difference. And and in particular, if I um, more specifically look at uh, here's an uh, an analysis on this from a 
actually a PRA paper we did in, in uh, 2015 where we studied quantum repeaters uh, uh, using space um, assets and um, we compared the transmission losses for s you know 2500 kilometer ground link and we looked at multiple um, uh, scenarios for different altitudes of satellites and we looked at the uh, in the end the main parameter is the, the double link loss that we care about right and to operate a, a system we want to be sort of 70 80 dB is max that can be tolerated for an entangled distribution for example entanglement distribution and what one finds is that if I now on the same scale were to plot the, uh, 2500 kilometer optical fiber using the latest uh, low no low no um, sorry low loss fiber we'd be talking something like 500 dB, so it's right up, uh, you know, way up there. So that's why satellite um, uh, uh, could be so powerful for long distances. So in Canada, we're working on a mission called KeySat, uh, which is going to be a, a scientific and technology demonstration mission uh, to, to study this ground-to-space quantum communication. Um, and and enable various uh, science experiments and demonstrations. It's um, a launch anticipated in 2024, 2025. Um, it's going to be a microsatellite uh, around 110 kilogram. Um, I should point out uh, it's all funded by the Canadian uh, government through the Canadian Space Agency, but also there's involvement from other Canadian um, entities and. Uh, um, um and uh, the prime contractor is Honeywell Canada. Um, and my, my team at the University of Waterloo is, the, uh, is under contract to be the, the scientific um, lead for the mission, and conduct the experiments and plan the and schedule the experiments. So the, the, the system will be a quantum receiver as well as a, a quantum transmitter with a, a faint laser um, type of source, WCP source, and we want to conduct various um, scientific tests, uh, so sort of linking uh, quantum networks uh, to, the, to the satellite. Um, we'll look at different ground station technologies. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm excited about having different type of quantum emitters. And sorry about the spellings here. Not sure what that, where that came from. Um, different quantum emitters. What I mean is, because we have a, a, an uplink, we can put the latest and greatest entangled photon source or a single photon emitter or quantum memories um, at, the, at the ground station and perform experiments. Um, the we have a large consortium of, of Canadian academics involved. So we have, uh, we just recently received the funding for a project called Quint, uh, which, is, which involves um, actually 19 PIs across Canada at universities, uh, primarily at universities, who will work on various topics around um, this large-scale quantum communication and satellites. This includes uh, protocols, so theoretical work, um, interfaces between space and ground networks, um, novel quantum sources and quantum detectors, and just like the study on quantum links, as well as um, interface the quantum link to space, space quantum link with quantum memories, which I think is a really important feature, which I'll come back to a little um, later. Uh, we also have international collaborators, uh, I should point out, uh, across uh, several um, countries and continent. And, uh, and most notably, we're also collaborating uh, with uh, teams here at FRL, uh, which is very exciting. And we look forward to, um, to a lot of these demonstrations and tests. Um, the technology of KeySat, so initially when KeySat was envisioned, uh, which, which uh, goes back more than well over 10 years, it was to have a, l a relatively low cost, um, simple uh, uh, asset in space, which is a quantum receiver, and keep the, flex the, the harder parts, which are the quantum sources, on the ground. We all know that the quantum link the qua uh, w is, is um, inferior, so it performs less when going up than down, so that's a, a, a disadvantage. But then the scientific merit and scientific flexibility um, would outperform or, or make up for this uh, disadvantage. So that was the kind of uh, philosophy and motivation. And I think it's already showing that given the large uh, science consortium and science community we can build around this mission, 
shows that there's a lot of interest to do various different experiments and tests with this platform. And the other thinking was that uh, we already see that we had to freeze the specs for our satellite right, l something like five years ago, right, when the mission was officially uh, uh, announced. And um, if I think about just the advancement of quantum sources in the past five years, and we, we don't even have our satellite up there yet, um, this, this again shows that, that uh, there's a lot more work happening on the quantum source side, and so it, it makes it much more interesting to be able to have the receiver in space. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we performed various um, demonstrations and tests, uh, like we built uh, prototypes, we did radiation testing, TVAC testing, other tests, and also we, we demonstrated the, the systems and the schemes, um, such as with this twin other aircraft here of, the of, of uh, NRC in Ottawa, um, which all was very exciting and interesting, and a lot of lessons were learned the quantum link, we, we spent a lot of time modeling the quantum link. Uh, we actually, w when starting this project, and now this goes back you know, more than uh, 10 years, we, we, we wanted to go back to a blank page of saying, well, what wavelengths, what encoding, what protocols, and, and we studied a whole bunch of different um, scenarios. One which, is, which is really interesting is that actually, uh, if you look at this table, and you can read it in our 2013 paper, <laughs> 10 years alra already ago, um, we looked at different wavelengths, and one thing that's what I found really interesting myself, which I didn't quite expect, is that there's not really, a, uh, a I mean, of course, 780 nanometer kind of winds or, or 850, but there's not a really clear um, winner, right? All the way from UV to telecom uh, are, are useful wavelengths. So I think that's very interesting. And the reason is that there's a lot of competing effects like beam diffraction uh, and absorption and scattering, and they make uh, one makes up for the other. So that's why it's actually quite, uh, quite a bit more balanced than one would expect. Um, we're building a quantum ground station in Canada, uh, sorry, in Waterloo in particular, um, and I just want to briefly introduce that. So here's a picture of the north end of our, of our Waterloo campus, and on, on this uh, building called RAC, the Research Advancement Center, we have a small dome where we have our own uh, quantum transmitter telescope uh, on the roof. And the, uh, the, the setup is, the s is such that the, 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 the transmitter optics is on the roof and we have fiber optics to a lab in the, f in the, in the level under, under the roof. And, and the in that lab, we'll be running our different quantum sources. We also have a science operation center and, um, and other infrastructure like like you know nanowire um, superconducting nanowire detectors and so on. So that's all in the nice in the nice lab. Uh, yeah, and here's a telescope that we built uh, custom, built by one of my, uh, one of my students and uh, and a lot of t uh, design effort and and trade off went into getting getting this custom lens here. Uh, it's an 80 inch uh, refractor, uh, designed and tested. Okay, so as we as we um, developed these schemes, we came across some some interesting problems, which we noticed in our um, in our uh, sort of prototyping and testing phases. So the reference frame alignment is a is a small challenge. It's not a you know not a fundamental challenge. A lot of people would say, oh, it's just an engineering problem. So what happens is as a this is a picture of our of our airplane uh, transmitter station, and as the airplane or later the satellite flies overhead, the, there's movement, right? The telescope is moving, uh, there's fiber optic uh, from the sources that go to the transmitter telescope. Um, it's just tricky to keep this reference frame of, of the polarization uh, between the source and the receiver aligned, right? What we did in this experiment was we, we had a set of wave plates. Here's a, a, a small picture that you can see, which would um, which would modulate the outgoing beam. And by rotating three wave plates, one can, one can perform any kind of uh, polarization unitary, uh, in, in and that's this was done in real time. So the challenge, though, is that, uh, and we don't want to use the same scheme for our satellite uh, project because we didn't want to have moving wave plates. Uh, first of all, we didn't want to have moving parts on our, on our transmitter telescope because we want to have, you know, achieve microradian type of pointing stability. So that was point A, but point B, let alone did we want to have moving wave plates in our actual beam. 
because every little wave plate will cause a bit of beam wander and and so we we've been looking uh, for ways to get around that and so we came up with um, an interesting scheme which is based on a on an um an actual paper from from colleagues in Singapore and also Bristol University called Reference Frame Independent QKD. We made a subversion of that, um, which is somewhat simpler and applies to our satellite. So the basic idea is that, um, and this is outlined in this 2019 paper, that uh, for for a QKD transmission or entanglement distribution. Uh, so what happens is if I look at my entangled state over there. Uh, we can see there's, there's the so-called computational basis, the zero one basis, which is um, maybe uh, stays intact, uh, uh, and for a satellite to ground link, this could be circular polarization. While the there's a phase term in the entanglement, which is where the drift can be. And what we were able to do is to show is a, a, a protocol where there's a six state measurement on one side and a four state measurement on the other side, and uh, one can perform a, a successful quantum key distribution because the the the, ba the computational basis that remains intact does not change, and it the phase term, um, even if it's changing, it doesn't impact the purity of the state. So by performing additional measurements on one of the entangled photons, one can get a essentially a, a, a purity measurement of the entangled state, even if this phase is arbitrarily rotated. And that allows to perform a successful transfer of, of keys or, or entanglement, I should also mention, without, without the need for active compensation. So that's why, why it's exciting. No more active comp It's all passive. And we put this to a test by actually using PM fiber for entangled photons, which when I kind of grew up, <laughs> this, this was a big no-no, right? You can't send polarization entanglement over polar, um, PM fiber. It doesn't work. It would take you here. And a lot of that is right, but we took a fresh look at it, and it actually turns out it's it's not that all that bad. And we're now performing. We actually now embarked. We've embarked on various tests um, to verify this. And so this will be useful as we send our signals to the satellite. On the ground, we'll have our six-state measurements in the three bases for this for the entangled for one of the entangled photon, and the other photon will go to space where we have this four-state analyzer on the satellite, and and by by performing this protocol, the what we call the six four state protocol, we can then uh, perform the sax we we can avoid the need for this active um, alignment. And indeed now uh, we we also have a, a small downlink uh, QKD source on board of the of the satellite, as I mentioned, a, a weak coherent pulse uh, source, which will em employ the same protocol of reference frame independence. So that means what we the benefit was that on the satellite we connect the 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 QGD source with the tele with the transmit telescope and the transmit optics via such kind of PM fibers, and we can avoid the need for any active compensation on board of the satellite um, uh, through this protocol. So that's also um, very interesting. And I, I do want to point out this was a uh, additional funding which which uh, is led by us in Waterloo, but involves uh, other partners and in particular UK partners. Photon emitters is very interesting. Um, so, so the, the main problem is that uh, when we work on QKD uh, with a satellite, one problem is, um, and it also applies to other protocols I should mention, not just QKD, also in distribution, that the, the sources we have today are usually probabilistic. Uh, so we have either attenuated lasers if it's just QKD, or if we have parametric down conversion if it's for entanglement generation. These sources are probabilistic in nature. And and uh, a satellite link, a satellite to ground link is actually quite problematic, because um, uh, one one it's only available for a very short time. It's it's just a few minutes, and also it's it's uh, typically very low um, transmis transmission rate, high losses. So so we're right at the end of of where those protocols work, and uh, it turns out one so. When, when investigating this whole landscape, and we just recently had a big white paper that, that I mentioned, I'll mention uh, later on again, um, called Keysight 2.0, we, we studied the impact of, of different technologies, and just by going to deterministic um, uh, photon emitters or entangled photon emitters, one can, 
one can really uh, increase the performance by, by order of magnitude or more. So if you think of where, where would you get the most bang for the buck, photon emitters, I think, is where I would um, definitely look into. So in this, in this kind of view, we, we did a sort of a, a, a quick and dirty proof of principle experiment with colleagues um, at, at IQC, Mike Reimer in his lab, who has these nice, very nice quantum dots, these nanopillars, which are manufactured in Ottawa by the uh, NRC team, by, by Robin Williams and, and colleagues. So um, what they allowed to do is, is create you know, very nice single photons, which can be, because they're in this, in this, very in this tapered nanowire, they can be coupled to single mode fiber very well. And, and we compared the performance of the, the quantum key distribution of such a single photon emitter a realistic one, you know, including the coupling losses and other problems with a comparatively clocked um, uh, weaker hand pulse source for QKD. And, and indeed, we were able to um, outperform the, uh, the, the laser-based source. And now this is not even accounting for the, for the pr improvements that uh, single photon emitters are, are currently experiencing. So photon encoding is another big topic of mine that I'm uh, very interested in. So, so what's the story there? Well, so far, um, a lot of these free space and satellite experiments have, have been focused on polarization encoding as the way to go. Polarization, it, it turns out actually, and I was mentioning it earlier in, in the conference to some colleagues, uh, it was one of the early tests of, of lasers actually. There was a free space experiment over a few kilometer where they tested out, you know, this was in the, in the late 60s, they tested out a laser beam traveling over a few kilometers, and and if the the atmospheric gra um, uh, ground conditions would impact the, the the polarization quality, and they found that within the measurement, uh, let's say sensitivity, uh, which was on the order of 10 to minus 4 or 10 to minus 5 in terms of polarization um, noise, it did not. Right. So that's that's the first indicator that polarization is really nice. However, when building all of our prototypes and doing our demonstrations on ground and, and other projects, we noticed or we learned uh, uh, often the hard way that polarization has a lot of issues uh, at the endpoints, right? At your transmitter and your receiver. That's where it gets difficult, right? Um, and so I have a lot of interest in finding other ways to work. And, and so time bin is something I, uh, over the past um, almost by, al by now also almost a decade I in my lab that we've investigated. Um, so so what's the problem with time bin? Well, if I so here's a time bin interferometer. Um, if I uh, if I send in my optical pulse and and I want to see the interference between the early and late pulse in this you know long and short type of um, of, of Michelson or Mach Zehnder interferometer. The problem is that, that the atmospheric turbulence, uh, the beam distortion that we get, which is, you know, turns it into a multi-mode beam, but even pointing errors, right, angle of incidence of the beam will cause a, a drastic uh, dephasing of, the, of this um, output of the interferometer. So we've been, disc you know, working on various ways to improve that and study it um, or, or find ways to, to fix this problem or work with the problem, and we came across um, Imaging interferometers, which interestingly had been around in the literature for for uh, Doppler um, Doppler imaging uh, in astronomy since the, the 70s and 80s, um, and, and there's various designs. So so we kind of rediscovered the wheel, <laughs> but, uh, but we've now been applying it to to quantum communication. So here's a design for one such interferometer, and it's very simple to see how this works. You notice that uh, what we have here is lenses in each of the arms, so the short arm and the long arm, and those lenses are nothing else than an imaging system. It's a one-to-one -one imager, like you think of a 4F uh, imaging, and uh, one has to just make sure that the imaging condition is such that the input beam, which splits up at, a, at the first beam splitter, is re-imaged to the output beam, uh, which is the second beam splitter. And one does it for both, for the long and the short. Of course, the lenses have to be different or whatever other optics is in the beams. And turns out magically, <laughs> so actually not magically, but, but it's very nice to see that, that it's pure passive, simple optics, and one gets full visibility, full interference visibility, even for multi-mode beams and, and, and everything. So, 
very interesting. We put this to use on a 1.2 kilometer demonstration of, of QKD uh, outdoors um, and uh, at our campus and it already showed off. It was very, the, the, the telescope system suddenly t turned um, simpler and easier, right? The receiver was just a simple lens and we coupled the beam into a multi-mode fiber, which can be done quite efficiently, right? Uh, so multi-mode, and that multi-mode beam then, uh, fiber, sorry, traveled to a, a box, uh, which had our interferometer, and we could get the full visibility and the full transfer. So I'm very excited about this, as you may, may be uh, able to tell. And uh, we've looked at various different protocols and schemes, various different interferometer designs, uh, with just glass or all, or reflective, There's Lots of we are already at the fifth generation of interferometer. There's some papers here which we can read up. And most importantly, I don't have time to talk about it, we've recently done scattering experiments as well, uh, which is here in this 2021 paper. We showed that this time bin encoding also survives f fully when uh, for, for diffusive scattering, uh, something which, which is unthinkable for polarization. Uh, we, we tried it for polarization, but it doesn't work. And this uh, has also very interesting avenues for quantum enhanced imaging or quantum sensing. Uh, and just recently, we performed a, a follow-up experiment of our reference frame independence, where we uh, were able to show that um, we, can, we can perform a time bin uh, quantum communication between t two such uh, receivers over a multi-mode channel. In our case, it was multi-mode fiber for time bin um, encoding and and uh, we can it's all passive we don't need any more active alignment of the transmitter receiver in interferometers which was always a big problem if we think of satellite to ground links and uh, we can show that it works very nicely uh, I don't have you know I'm happy I'm more than happy to tell you later there's uh, the archive paper that we recently um, uploaded uh, where you could find more information I should mention this is also one of the very few um, uh, demonstrations of, of this quantum transfer over multi-mode fiber uh, with, with all passive methods, not using any, let's say, beam correction or mode correction. So now I'd like to go to Outlook and what's next, uh, give some perspectives on this. Um, so we've embarked already on, on several studies towards, uh, you know, reaching larger distances. So one of the visions is, and this is a project theme called KISA 2.0 that's ongoing in Canada, where we're envisioning a, a Canadian-wide quantum entanglement network, um, which can you know cover east to west and also including north, north to south. Uh, and um, what we've determined in this in this white paper study is that um, quantum entanglement distribution and quantum quantum teleportation would be the 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 most um, sort of uh, highest impact uh, uh, endeavor and and so we've we've coined out a, a possible future mission concept as which which says uh, which aims to do quantum teleportation across Canada and um, so I think that's very important uh, yeah and there's an archive paper which we recently uploaded uh, with with our our white paper summary um, we're also part of a project called hyperspace uh, which is um, a joint project with European partners. So re from a recent um, funding round uh, between Canada and Europe uh, to study the impact or the uti uti uh, sorry, utility of hyper-entanglement and higher dimensional entanglement. So the story is that we've, been we've performed sort of link and orbit analysis for, for let's say intercontinental quantum entanglement distribution between uh, somewhere in Canada and Europe. And it turns out, but just using uh, regular, you know, so non-repeater methods, just photons, qubits, it is very difficult. And it's actually much harder than I thought. I was, uh, I was almost maybe naively thinking, oh, we'll just put the satellite to MEO and it will be all fine. But it turns out it's much more difficult uh, and because the losses and, and also the orbit utilization is, is difficult. So one has to go high up and, and, and so on. So um, now the, the purpose of this study is to see how can hyper-entanglement and higher dimensional entanglement help. And so there's several partners in this project investigating these schemes. Uh, we've also been involved in a study actually led by JPL 
um, on a deep space quantum link, which looked at um, various sort of mission scenarios uh, between Earth and Moon uh, and beyond uh, for, for investigating fundamental science in space and entanglement distribution in space. And, and um, it was a very interesting study, again, very uh, with, with multiple inter international partners, uh, as well as, of course, the leadership from the US. And I'd like to draw your attention to that paper that was published last year. Um, and and for this uh, these studies of long distances, I will also say one has to take a step back again, and and all of the the kind of parameters and configurations are back on the table. Uh, that's why it's more like a white paper type of analysis. Um, you know, wavelength, uh, photon encoding, orbits and config uh, configurations, and and other things, applications. It's all back. One has to go back to the drawing board because. A lot of the schemes that were developed for for just these initial uh, quantum links uh, are the kind of the first step, but towards a global network, one has to um, think uh, think further and and uh, and think out of the box, so to say. Um, and and as you'll find in this paper, one of the studies we did is uh, or investigations is look at what kind of orbits could be or scenarios could be useful for a double link from space uh, asset to, to ground uh, for entanglement distributions. And I don't want to go into all of those dots. We looked at you know up and down and various platforms. And there's a, an area that is kind of shaded, which is the, no the wh where the double link is not feasible because we have link losses, but also link duration. So th this plot is link loss on the x. and, and uh, kind of like minimum time that's required for the entanglement distribution in the vertical. And, um, and one can see that only a couple of those scenarios are, are feasible. So, so that's going to be um, already, that's already guiding us in, into a direction of where future mission scenarios would, uh, uh, how they'd be um, organized. And finally, um, I'd like to mention um, that uh, a major, um, a major direction for, for future quantum networks, in, sp in particular in space, would be to have involvement of quantum repeaters. And, and this now brings in quantum memory systems, and but also quantum processors. And, and uh, I think there's more and more growing um, sort of a consensus in the community as well that, that this is where it will have to go eventually for, for a global network. Uh, one, one scheme I already mentioned is uh, our 2015 paper with, uh, led by Christoph Simon at, at Calgary University, which has several entangled photon um, emitters in space, uh, satellites, or maybe just one which is really high up. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but on the ground, these, these entangled photons meet up at, uh, at ground stations that have quantum repeater technology, meaning quantum memories and quantum non-demolition measurements. And, and uh, so it's kind of um, a, a conceivable way of doing this because one can keep the, m the harder, more complicated technology on the ground at the ground stations while the entangled sources can be launched into space. And that, that's uh, so, so overall, actually, I think a very appealing concept. And I, oh I should say the, and the, uh, the EPS uh, in geostationary was actually just for comparison to as one scenario to do the, the, the link um, without memories. And, and so in that paper, we showed that indeed uh, a repeater around the Earth could be done with something like eight entanglement segments uh, using this kind of scheme. Since then, people have come up with, with new variants. So uh, uh, recently, just two years ago, colleagues uh, in particular out of Germany and, and uh, UK have come up with a scheme where the the central node node which in our concept was on the ground is now uh, also in space and the rates were drastically improved now this but this requires now remember uh, putting quantum memories quantum q and d measurements and all kind of complex uh, systems in the space and and also but there's other schemes such as uh, the one that was uh, mentioned actually two days ago about uh, from from uh, colleagues here in the us of putting uh, NV center based uh, uh, systems uh, um, also uh, into space. So, so I'll come to the end <laughs> with this. Uh, 
So I would like to acknowledge my, my research group here, um, which, which is uh, very in in, um, critical in making all of this happen. And I'd also like to thank uh, a lot of the sponsors and partners which make all of this work happen. I and, and most importantly, in, in the Canadian government is the Canadian Space Agency and, and other funding agencies which, which make all of this happen. Small additional mention is uh, startups. Um, there is in, in Canada, we have several startups in this realm. In particular, there's, there's one startup, Keynet, that I'm also involved in myself, uh, full disclosure, and we're already looking at uh, commercial versions of, of, um, of uh, satellite communication payloads that could be useful. So that's it's, it's a definitely a growing um, environment. So, okay, so thank you very much. Larry Merkel again. Thank you for a very engaging and informative talk. Uh, my limited understanding is that QKD is vulnerable to denial of service attacks, and I'm hoping you can tell me that my understanding is naive and why. Um, no, it, yeah, you're right. It is. Uh, it is a single photon scheme. Um, it it will be. You know, if if an it, if the channel can be flooded with photons. Um, it, it can deny it, the service can be denied you know, the QKD transfer. So one important part of QKD though is that the the transfer is is just to generate a key. It's not your actual information that is traveling. So I know that maybe that's not a huge relief, but at least uh, it doesn't impact your actual data uh, as such, because um, if the QKD system is working properly, it will discover any such attack, not just, you know, denial of service, it will discover other attacks as well, and and report this, and then the, the result will be that you don't get a key out of that particular run. So in that way, um, it it, um, it can hopefully, uh, you know, be th separate data transfer from key generation. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. That was a really interesting talk, and it was amazing to see QKD being implemented. So, uh, the I had a, I have a question regarding the reference frame independent uh, quantum key distribution. So, there you said uh, that you are doing a six four state measurement, and uh, it looks like it, there's quantum tomography and everything involved in it. And uh, does it mean that it's not a single shot communication, as in like you send a, uh, an information that using only a single qubit but so okay. yeah thank thanks um single shot uh the i mean it's still single shot measurements and the only requirement we have on the on the channel is that this phase that i mentioned in the entangled state is stable during a certain block size so um but this is in in any qkd it's always a statistical um sort of assessment of the channel right it's never a single shot assessment even in regular QKD, um, Alice and Bob have to perform, you know, parameter estimation and so on, which is done on a certain sample of of uh, photon detections, and in that way, it's the same. It's it's the same approach, but but what is different now is that in our protocol, the the purity of the quantum states are done even if there's rotation, right? So there's if you think about it twice, there's not actually a huge surprise <laughs> because uh, Stokes Stokes uh, parameter, you know, polari polarimetry has been around a long time, and it can tell the degree of polarization from just a few fixed measurements. So it's it's in that kind of spirit. Uh, also, I have a follow. -up, uh, I have a follow-up question regarding the phase. So the phase, uh, as I've r studied in some papers, the phase depends on the wavelengths uh, of the photons as well, and also depends on the uh, uh, on the time of detection. Like if the two photons are detected at a different time. So, is that all considered in your, uh, like when you say you need require a pure entangled uh, state, so is that all considered in that phase when you're doing it? Oh yeah, yeah, and in our experiments we actually deliberately varied the phase uh, with, with piezo actuators just to make sure we are we're disturbing the system. And, and yes, it, it has been uh, considered. I'm, I'm happy to give more details separately. Yeah. Thank you. 
this is just a remark, but um, I, was, I was at a conference last week with Professor Brassard, who was speaking um, of BB, of course. Um, and, and he pointed out that QKD has been misnamed from the very beginning, that it should be quantum key establishment and not quantum key distribution, which implies movement of sort. Uh, so th that has led, I think, to a lot of confusion about what is actually transmitted and when uh, for this. So he, he's pretty big on that. I think it'll still keep being called QKD. But yeah, thanks for the comment. Yeah, it's a really valid comment. Yeah, thanks. QK, quantum key establishment, that's it, yeah. And I've, I've also seen talks of him and yes, I, but he's right, he has a point. Thank you. So thank you very much for your flexibility here. Um, in a second, we're going to head to lunch in the back. You know the deal on day three, uh, the two different areas. Following lunch, there'll be lab tours. You can sign up and be assigned to different groups. Everyone's, of course, welcome, and we'll, we'll accommodate everyone that's here uh, at the tables in the back as well as registration, so please sign up for those. Um, since we won't necessarily be coming back here and sitting down right now, I'm just going to offer some thank yous and closing remarks uh, and then we'll get on with lunch, so I promise to be quick. Okay. So as we close out uh, this year's Q4I workshop, we've been fortunate to hear from you, our experts, our leading scientists and engineers and visionaries, really, in this field who've shared your expertise and groundbreaking research with us, so we're very thankful for that. Um, so on behalf of Colonel Garcia, our director, who you heard from earlier this week, and myself, the information director at, at AFRL, and our quantum team, I say thank you for your high level of engagement, participation, enthusiasm, and certainly excitement this week. Uh, you, you bring life to this event, and um, we wouldn't be here without your participation. And we certainly know, uh, you know, we say, and, and um, Bob Suter can attest to this, you know, every week there's a different quantum event. and. Uh, we're, we're very thankful that you chose Q4I, especially for our international travelers, those who traveled long distances to get here. Uh, we have visitors, I think if I counted right, from four different continents. Uh, it's been a tough week for travel in the U.S. Uh, many folks were affected, and we can't even just blame, as we usually do, the snow in central New York. They had nothing to do with difficulties in travel. But um, we appreciate your perseverance for um, getting here. And um, we certainly want to thank... Uh, you know, think of the Q4I workshop as a platform for collaboration, inspiration, and exchange of ideas that transcend our borders. And this is, what, to me, what it's really about in bringing together different fields and different disciplines. On behalf of the organizing committee, I definitely want to extend my deepest gratitude to all of our speakers, participants, the organizers, and the planning teams. It takes so long to put this type of event together. And so first, let me um, recognize the Griffiths Institute team. So of course, uh, first and foremost, Melissa Tallman, Kelly Pointer, uh, you've met, uh, certainly met and interacted with uh, the rest of the team, Mike Wessing, Darren Boris, Amy James, Corinne Bush, Stephen Armstrong, Dylan Snow, Nick Wilcox, Bill Carmen, Trey Martin, Jim Ray, and Darren Dealey. Uh, thank you so much to the Griffiths Institute. And for the uh, information directorate team, certainly Miss um, Laura Wessing, Dr. Kathy Ann Soderberg, Dr. Don Teleska, Mr. John Magellino, and Lieutenant Colonel Dean Corsack for helping pull all of this together. I have the pleasure and the honor of just being up here and narrating the event. They do all the hard work behind the scenes that takes so long to um, put together. Lastly, uh, please save the date for next year. You know, we're already locking in our week of quantum here. So June 25th, 26th, and 27th of 2024, we'll meet back here at the Innovari Advancement Center for hopefully another wonderful exchange. So again, thank you so much. Please go out, enjoy lunch, and continue to network.